Good morning. My name is Joshua Dullahan. I use the He Him series, and I am the Assistant Dean of Instruction and Student Affairs at the Rouser College of Natural Resources. Uh, welcome to the Rouser College uh, Undergraduate Research Showcase. Uh, this morning, we will be featuring some of the spectacular biological research that our amazing undergraduate students have done this past year. Um, first, I'd like to extend a well-earned congratulations to our presenters today. Uh, you should all be very proud of yourselves, and I hope that there are friends and family tuning in today as you share your contributions uh, to the growing research in your field. Uh, as you may know, this is the final day of Cal Week. Uh, we likely have some new, uh, newly admitted Rouser CNR students in the audience, and probably a few LNS students who are thinking after this week, I want to transfer to that college. Uh, so for our new admits, congratulations on your admissions and keep in mind as you watch the presentations today that this could be you in two to four years. Um, so when I was in college many, many years ago, uh, my professor who taught me research methods told me that research is like a puzzle in which the puzzle builders design their own pieces and these pieces come together to create a bigger image that creates a better understanding of the world around us. And as you may know, Rouser CNR's motto is see the bigger picture and make a better world. Today, each of our presenters adds a puzzle piece to the bigger picture. So without much further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Patricia Hellier, college advisor for the plant and microbial biology majors. Um, Patricia. Thanks, Josh. Uh, thank you, Dean Joshua, for starting us off. Welcome to the Spring 2021 Rouser College of Natural Resources Virtual Research Showcase. As Josh mentioned, my name is Patricia Hellyer. I'm the advisor for the plant and microbial biology majors in the college. Uh, I'd like to introduce Craig Crossley, our office's intake advisor. Together, we'll be moderate, moderating today's virtual research showcase. To that end, we'd like to go over the flow of today's showcase and provide some instructions, which Craig will review with you now. Excellent. Hi, friends. Uh, I'm Craig Crossley, the intake advisor for the college. Um, we're so lucky to have 24 students participating in this uh, year's uh, virtual research showcase. Uh, each student will have 10 minutes to go through their slides and any audience questions we can fit within that time. Uh, each student will uh, read it aloud to the, and then, um, well, I guess we'll read it aloud to the uh, presenter at the end of their presentation. Um, if there isn't enough time, the presenter may be answering questions through the Q&A. So feel free to you know, kind of submit Q&A questions as, um, as you have them during each presenter's um, presentation. Uh, please note that the chat is disabled um, and the session is being recorded. We'll upload it to our, uh, I believe, our Cal Week website as well as our um, our CNR YouTube channel. So excellent. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Our first presenter is Claire Perrin, an MEB student. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. All right. Is everyone able to see that? Okay, all That's right, good. thank you. Good morning, my name is Claire. My project is on identifying drought resistant genes in CRISPR-Cas9 transformed tomato plants. I'm in the molecular environmental biology department and I wanna give a huge thanks to Professor Dodd for sponsoring this project and Dr. Marti for all his mentorship and support. So I used a wild drought tolerant tomato species endemic to the Atacama Desert as a model for CRISPR transformation. The Atacama Desert is the driest non-polar desert in the world. The average rainfall is below 10 millimeters per year, and there are periods of up to four years with no rainfall. And Solanum sidians is a wild tomato species endemic to the Atacama Desert, so it tolerates extreme drought and salinity conditions and provides a great model to identify genes involved in drought resistance. So the abscisic acid stress ripening or ASR gene family is involved in response to abiotic stress such as drought and salinity. And Solanum sidians, the drought tolerant tomato found in the Atacama Desert and Solanum lycopersicum, the domesticated tomato show stark differences in the ASR4 gene. So this figure shows basic local alignment search tool or BLAST results for Solanum lycopersicum and Solanum sidians in the bottom row. And as you can see, Solanum sidians has two deletions, which are shown in the dashes. It has one deletion of 56 base pairs, followed by another deletion of 36 base pairs in the ASR4 gene. 
And so CRISPR-Cas9 technology was used to knock out these two regions in domesticated Solanum lycopersicum tomatoes. And CRISPR uses small guide RNAs or gRNAs to direct Cas9 endonuclease to specific, to specific DNA sites. So two gRNAs were used to create two different constructs of transformed tomatoes. Construct one plants have the first 56 base pair knockout and construct two plants have the second 36 base pair knockout. So after a dog lab sequenced Solanum sidians from the Atacama Desert and transformed plants using CRISPR-Cas9, I sequenced plants to determine that the two CRISPR constructs were successfully incorporated into the transformed plants. So this involved germinating seeds and transplanting tomatoes as they grew larger. I then collected samples from the greenhouse, homogenized samples using a bead beater, and performed DNA extractions using a CTAB procedure. Next, I ran PCRs with primers targeting the areas in the ASR4 gene that were knocked out using CRISPR. And then here's a photo of a gel using those PCR products. Samples were then sent for sequencing and analyzed using SNAP gene, which is shown in the bottom here, and then BLAST, which I mentioned earlier. So next, after confirming both CRISPR constructs were successfully incorporated into transformed tomatoes, I tested the plant's phenotypic response to drought and heat stress. So the experimental design involved four different treatments using two growth chambers in the UC Berkeley greenhouse. So one growth chamber had a temperature of 26 degrees Celsius and the other had a temperature of 36 degrees. And within each growth chamber, half the plants received water and the half did not. And there were three genotypes used in each treatment. So two CRISPR constructs with the different regions of the ASR4 gene knocked out and then a control with no CRISPR transformation and plants were left in the growth chamber for eight days and then returned to the main greenhouse for recovery at ambient temperature and with water. So I expected both CRISPR constructs of the transformed tomatoes to withstand drought, drought and heat stress better than the non-CRISPR control since the transformed tomatoes were modeled after the wild drought tolerant Solanum obsidian species. So here are the results from the stress test with the four different treatments. All the plants from treatments one and three, which were watered, survived eight days in the growth chamber, but construct two tomatoes showed drought tolerance in treatments two and four without water. So just as a reminder, both constructs are plants that had the different regions of the ASR4 gene knocked out. So these graphs are showing the number of plants alive versus time. The number of construct one plants over time is shown by the yellow line, construct two is in red, and control plants are in this mint green color. So the y-axis shows the number of plants alive. Each genotype started with three plants. And then over the eight days in the growth chamber, plants began to die without water. So looking at treatment two, by the end of the eight days, all con construct one and control plants died, but 66% or two of the three plants from construct two survived eight days without water. And then for treatment four, which was hotter, we see similar results. Since the temperature is hotter than treatment two, the plants did start dying faster than treatment two, but 33% or one of the three plants from construct two still survived eight days at really high heat and without water. So construct two is showing really remarkable drought resistance in both cases. And here are some images of the stress test. I'm focusing on images from treatment two, which was the top graph in the previous slide. It just highlights the differences between the three genotypes a little bit better since treatment four was quite aggressive due to the 36 degrees heat stress. So these images are from three days of recovery after eight days in the growth chamber. And construct one and control plants, as you can see, completely died, whereas construct two was very much alive, healthy, and even grew new tomatoes and flowers. So it's showing remarkable drought resistance. And this brings me to my key findings and conclusions. So I was able to successfully use the CRISPR-Cas9 protocol to knock out two regions of the ASR4 gene. This was shown by sequencing the ASR4 gene in transformed tomatoes. And then the seeds gathered from transformed tomatoes and germinated also had the transformed gene, which is showing that the CRISPR transformation was stable across generations. And the stress test results strongly support the role of the ASR4 gene in drought and heat stress response. So transformed tomatoes with the CRISPR construct two showed drought tolerance unlike the other two genotypes, 
which is implying that the 36 base pair deletion, the second deletion in the ASR4 gene, may confer drought resistance in CRISPR-Cas9 transformed tomato plants. And this could provide a means of introducing increased drought tolerance in tomatoes and other crops. And so this has profound and exciting implications, especially when applied to agriculture and food production. Some benefits can include heightened drought tolerance, which is particularly important as climate change progresses. Uh, CRISPR-Cas9 transformed crops could also increase the stability and resilience of food systems and decrease agricultural water use. And this would contribute to a more sustainable system of food production overall. And moving forward, I will verify the results by conducting another stress test. I will also conduct amplicon sequencing to verify results and determine how strong inheritance is across generations. And finally, I will search for other genes that may be involved in drought resistance. So that's the end of my slides. Thank you. Let me know if anyone has any questions. Fantastic, Claire. Um, I just, for one question for you, um, how has the, I guess, the, the last year of COVID affected your research and your process um, yeah. and changing it to virtual? Definitely. I was super, super fortunate to be able to go into a lab in person um, due to, because I was doing an honors project, so it's sort of like a caveat. Um, and so I was still able to go in and do DNA extractions and PCRs, gels, all that stuff in the lab. And then I also had access to the greenhouse. So it didn't actually um, affect me too much. And if anything, it's made research easier because classes are virtual. I can kind of just do classes from wherever. So for me, it's almost been the pandemic has made things a bit easier. I mean, there are some supply shortages in certain pipette tips and sort certain things that kind of happened earlier in the year with, um, you know, COVID, I don't know, just trying to get masks and gloves and all that sort of stuff made. There were sort of some shortages in supplies that we needed, which I totally understood. And I didn't want to take away those supplies when they were needed more for more COVID research. But um, yeah, other than that, I, I had, I was very fortunate with all the COVID. So. Amazing. Um, okay, my other question is, do you grow tomatoes for fun or is it strictly research? Do you, do you like separate your work from your home life? I, um, I, so I'm from Seattle, but I'm, I'm living here right now, but Seattle, the, it's a bit too cold for tomatoes, but um, I definitely, I don't grow tomatoes outside, but I, my dream is to have a vegetable garden with lots of veggies like tomatoes and lettuce and also citrus tree. Um, I don't have room in my apartment now for that, but definitely want to get there someday. So, yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, looks like um, there's no additional questions. So we will go ahead and move on. Thank you very much, Claire. Also, um, I have the same dream about growing gardens and I'm starting on it myself, as and so is Craig. <laughs> so we're very much interested in your research. Um, thanks, Claire. Next up, we have Sarah Amalpour from the Molecular Environmental Biology major. Sarah, uh, take it away. Okay, can you see that? Yes, it's up. Okay, perfect. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Ampelur and today I will be discussing my research investigating the role of DNMT3A on intramuscular insulin resistance. So more and more people every day all over the world are developing metabolic disorders that are associated with insulin resistance, such as type 2 diabetes mellitus. So it's important for us to understand the molecular mechanisms and develop new treatment options to help the rising amount of people that are afflicted by these disorders. Before I start, I'd like to thank um, my PI, Dr. Sona Kang, and our lab members, Neha Villavalam, for their help in guiding me throughout this research and for conducting the experiments for this study. Today, we will talk about three things. First, an introduction of the relevant topic material, then the results of the experiments, and lastly, a discussion of those results. Insulin plays a large role in maintaining glucose homeostasis. And the left diagram is a description of the cycle in the most simple form. So when you have high blood sugar, the beta cells of your pancreas will produce and release insulin, and that causes cells in the skeletal muscle liver and fat to translocate GLUT4 receptors from the cytoplasm to the outer cellular membrane. 
This allows the cells to bring in plasma glucose for further storage within the tissue as glycogen. In the reverse, when you have low blood sugar, the insulin will not be released and other hormones like glucagon will be released to stimulate glycogen breakdown and increase blood sugar. Insulin resistance occurs over time and due to a variety of complex factors, which researchers are still figuring out today. But what we do know is that the cells in the um, skeletal muscle, liver, and fat will not respond to insulin as well. So more and more insulin is necessary to uptake the same amount of glucose. And over time, the beta cells of the pancreas can't keep up with this. They will become exhausted and not be able to produce enough insulin. So the blood sugar will be too high. And this has a lot of implications on your body um, and it can lead to organ damage, cardiovascular problems, and even death if it's uncontrolled. There's increasing evidence that epigenetic modifications of the DNA play a role in metabolic disorders. And these effects can be passed down through generations. In a previous study by the Kang lab, DNMT3A was found to mediate insulin resistance in adipose tissue. So we wanted to focus on potential effects on the skeletal muscle for this study. DNMT3A can add or remove a methyl group from the fifth position of cytosine residues that are commonly found in CPG islands. The addition of the methyl group causes DNA to become tightly wound, preventing transcription factors from accessing the DNA so there would be no gene product. When the methyl group is removed, the DNA is less tightly bound and the gene will be expressed. DNMT3A can methylate target genes in response to environmental factors and stressors. And one of those stressors in the context of metabolic disorder is a high fat diet, which is correlated with insulin resistance. The identification of these genes can provide targets for drug therapies in treating these disorders. So what we know is that DNMT3A mediates insulin resistance in fat cells, which respond to insulin signaling in the same manner as skeletal muscle. We want to know if it also plays a role in the skeletal muscle response, and if so, which genes are targets of DNMT3A. To carry out this project, we used a previously generated mouse line that did not have DNMT3A in their skeletal muscles, which I will refer to as the knockout mice. This allows us to observe any difference between the knockout and wild type mice that may be caused by the lack of DNMT3A in the muscle. We had two cohorts of mice. One was fed a typical chow diet and the other was fed a high fat diet to create conditions that can lead to insulin, resist, insulin resistance and metabolic disorder. To start, we conducted an insulin tolerance test to determine if there were any phenotypic differences in glucose uptake in response to insulin signaling. In the mice fed a chow diet, there was an overall significant difference in the ability of the knockout mice to lower the blood glucose as much as the wild type mice in response to insulin. In the mice fed a high fat diet, from 30 minutes and on after insulin injection, there was a significant difference in the knockout and wild type mice. And when looking at the area under the curve graph D, it is clear that the mice were even more unable to reduce the glucose levels as much as the wild type mice. We can also compare the knockout mice fed a high fat diet versus those fed a chow diet. And we can see that those fed a high fat diet had a lower response to insulin. The results of this insulin tolerance test show that there are differences in insulin response due to DNMT3A. Next, we conducted a glucose tolerance test to determine if there are any differences in the ability to uptake excess glucose when we did not externally administer insulin. I expected that the knockout mice would not be able to decrease blood glucose levels at the same rate as the wild type mice, However, the results show that there is no significant difference between any of the mice. And this is inconsistent with the prior results in the ITT. And it shows that at this time point, at seven weeks, there were no differences in internal insulin signaling. So we would like to do further studies to better understand this difference. Um, and one option would be to repeat the GTT several weeks after this and allow for any insulin resistance to further develop. Lastly, we extracted and sequenced RNA to see if there were any genes that were differentially expressed between the wild type and knockout mice. 
This heat map shows that when comparing the wild type and knockout mice, 26 genes were upregulated without the presence of DNMT3A, and four genes were downregulated. We analyzed the identity and known action of these genes and think that CCL21C is a potential key gene target of DNMT3A for intramuscular insulin resistance. CCL21C is a ligand for CCR7, which brings T cells to tissues at sites of chronic inflammation, which is associated with the development of insulin resistance, obesity, and metabolic disorder. In conclusion, through the results of this study, we determined that the methylation of target genes by DNMT3A plays a role in the development of intramuscular insulin resistance, and CCL21C is a potential key target of DNMT3A. In the future, we'd like to repeat the RNA extraction and sequencing with mice fed a high fat diet to see if there are any differences in fold expression levels and any changes from those fed a chow diet. We'd also like to confirm CCL21C as a key genetic target of DNMT3A and do further studies to see if removing CCL21C will rescue cells from insulin resistance. We can also analyze the other genes that we identified in the RNA sequencing. And lastly, we'd like to see if applying the mice genetic data from this study can be applied to human cells um, when considering targets for therapy against insulin resistance and associated disorders like type 2 diabetes mellitus. Um, thank you for your time. Do you guys have any questions? If any questions, please type in the Q&A feature. Quick question for you, Sarah. Do, how did you find this research particularly? Is there something that like drove you or motivated you? Yeah, so well, a lot of people in my family have diabetes. So this was something that was close to me. Um, and I always wanted to be a part of researching something and being able to contribute to a greater cause. So when I discovered that this research was going on, I knew I had to be involved and be a part of finding a solution to diseases that affect a, such a majority of the population. Incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, next, we have uh, Katrina Black, also a molecular environmental biology student. Katrina, take it away. Hi, everyone. So let's see. Good morning, everyone. My name is Katrina, and today I'm going to be discussing my research on self incompatibility in the hexaploid Prunus domestica. I wanted to give a quick thank you to my advisors, Professor Dodd, as well as Dr. Marty, for all of the guidance and encouragement they have given me on this project. <clears throat> I'm going to begin with some background on what makes this species so unique and why it should be studied. Uh, so the trait I'm studying is self-incompatibility. Self-incompatibility is an important evolutionary mechanism which prevents self-fertilization. In nature, this promotes genetic diversity through outcrossing or allogamy or cross-fertilization. Uh, these traits are evolutionarily beneficial because they can reduce the risk of certain diseases and genetic abnormalities. However, the opposite of self-incompatibility or known as self-compatibility is the most important thing to look at from a breeding perspective in order to produce the highest yield of fruit bearing plants, especially as pollinating insects become more scarce. So the photo on the right gives an overview of the compatibility system. And so in order to create a successful pollination, the pollen alleles, which are indicated at the top of the figure, and are numbered S1 through S3, need to be unique from the pistil alleles, which are indicated on the bottom of the figure. So in the picture on the left, you can see that S1 and through S3 match in both, both the pollen genotype and the pistil genotype, meaning that the plant is self incompatible. And so the pollen tube stops growing. Whereas in the second picture, all of the pollen alleles differ from the pistil alleles 
which means that the plant is considered self-compatible and the pollen tube can reach the ovule, which will eventually produce a fruit. The self-compatible allele that I'm studying results in non-functioning of the self-incompatibility system. So now I'm going to give a quick introduction to the species itself. Prunus domestica is a very popular snack when dried, uh, and the seed oil contains many benefits for the skin and hair. The origin of this fruit is a hybrid of the diploid species Prunus sericifera and tetraploid species Prunus spinosa. This is part of what makes the species so unique because the Prunus domestica is a hexaploid, which leads me to my next slide. A hexaploid contains six copies of each chromosome instead of the typical two copies in a diploid species. Therefore, the genome can have allelic variation at each of the six chromosomes, which makes it even more difficult to find self-compatible fruit. There have been over 100 papers published on self-compatibility for other diploid prunus species, such as almond, apricot, cherry, and plum. However, because of the difficulty working with a hexaploid, there have been less than five papers published on Prunus domestica. So the goal for my project was to identify the self-compatibility allele that results in non-functioning of the whole self-compatibility system among different Prunus domestica plant samples. Additionally, I was also identifying allelic variability within the samples. So an over, here's an overview of how I planned to test my hypothesis. I began with sample collection, which included going to pick leaves off of the trees, and then I extracted DNA from those leaves and amplified the DNA using PCR, and then quantified the PCR results with gel electrophoresis. So my data collection began with around 130 plants last winter. Um, and so I did DNA extractions on those using a CTAP procedure. However, the DNA was difficult to isolate due to contamination from phenols and polysaccharides because I initially extracted from buds, which are pictured in the middle, um, and they're a lot tougher. Uh, so then I went back to winters in uh, January when there were flowers on the tree, or yeah, there are flowers on the trees, and I collected plant material from the leaves uh, and performed DNA extractions the same day. Um, so once I finally got a uh, good quality DNA, the next step is to um, run PCRs with different primers. And the, the primer I began with um, was a universal primer. And so how that works is it works for the entire Prunus family, and it gives a good overview of um, all of the alleles that each sample had. Uh, and so we used the PRU C2 slash PCER primer to identify the variability of alleles for the different samples, specifically looking at the SI gene. Um, each lane, which is like indicated at the top and goes across, each lane can have up to six bands and each band is the, the green bands that are numbered in the bottom part of the gel. Um, so each lane can have up to six bands, which represent the six alleles. Um, and as you can see, we we identified almost 17 or 17 allele, different alleles. And we found that S17, which is indicated in lane 10 and 14 and a couple other ones, um, we found that that, gene, that allele is associated with self-compatibility. So then once we found the allele that we wanted to look at, we had a more, um, we narrowed down kind of the allele we were looking at in the next primer. Um, so the next primer we used specifically targeted the S17 slash S allele. Um, and so this, instead of having like the six bands in each lane, there was only one band and there was either a presence or absence of it. And so in the gel, if there was a presence of the band, um, it indicated that the sample had the self-compatible genotype, whereas the absence of the band indicated the self-incompatible genotype. So finally, from interpreting the gels, we identified 17 alleles, um, and this variability will be helpful in the future, in future plant breeding to prevent diseases which can arise from a lack of genetic diversity. 
Additionally, we found that at least one of the 17 alleles, like I said, um, was identified with self-compatible plants. So following up, kind of the next step is to create self-compatible plants using CRISPR-Cas9 technologies to transform the hexaploid prunus domestica in order to knock out the self-incompatible alleles. Ultimately, our findings give us an improved understanding of the sexual production mechanism among the prunus species. Additionally, our findings will create faster next generation breeding as breeders can use molecular markers for early detection of the self, of the self compatible genotype rather than having to use phenotypic data, which can take a lot longer. These findings could have a major impact in the agricultural field and beyond. So thanks for listening. Uh, yeah, please let me know if you have any questions. Yeah, I have a two part question for you, Katrina. Um, I guess the first being, do you need a permit to collect samples? And then the second being, how did you choose winters or that, that specific like tree grove in particular? Yeah, so we actually are collaborating with um, a lab in with a UC Davis lab. And so um, they are the ones that kind of take care of all of the trees over there. Um, and it's more of like a farm. It's not, they're not like wild species. And so, um, yeah, mostly through that, we kind of decided that um, those were the plants that we wanted to perform extractions on. And they have a lot more information on each of the trees. Um, and they're kind of also performing <clears throat> experiments on those trees. So it, it's really cool to be able to collaborate with them. and. Um, yeah, they provide a lot of information as well that was helpful with my project. Awesome, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Katrina. Um, so uh, next up we have uh, Nicholas Blanade, also molecular environmental biology student. Uh, Nicholas, take it away. Hi, uh, my name is Nick. Here, I'll share my screen. And there we go. All right. Uh, my name is Nick Blanade. Um, I'm a molecular and environmental biology major. Um, and my project is titled Manzanita Drinking Habits, the Change in Water Use of Manzanita Resprouts Post Fire. So what is manzanita? Um, manzanita is an iconic shrub that can be found in chaparral communities across California, and it's known for its distinctive red bark. Now, the specific species of manzanita that I studied, Arctostaphylos calendulosa, is really cool because it has a, it has a lignotuber or a burl that allows it to resprout, resprout post-fire, as we can see um, in the picture on the right, along with roots that can extend up to nine feet deep. Um, now, I was originally interested in the resprouting mechanism because it's really cool. It allows plants to regrow quickly due to um, the lignotubers storing non-structural carbohydrates. However, I realized that um, it's actually unknown if resprouts use different water sources um, or if the lignotuber can potentially store water. Now, in order to understand um, what water sources a plant uses, um, we have to do isotope analysis um, of the plant's water. Now, isotopes are atoms that have different numbers of neutrons. So for example, oxygen 16 is oxygen that has 16 neutrons and oxygen 18 has, is oxygen that has 18 neutrons. Um, and the ratio of these isotopes can be expressed in delta notation. So delta 18O, for example, for oxygen or for hydrogen, it's known as delta D or delta 2H. Um, now different water, now the ratios of these waters uh, or the ratios of these isotopes will change um, during transport processes. So for example, during evaporation, um, the water will become isotopically lighter because heavier isotopes don't evaporate as well. Um, and this means that we can actually determine uh, or different water sources will have very specific delta D and delta 18 O ratios, which allows us to determine um, which water sources a plant uses by comparing the plants delta D and delta 18 O to those of the source waters. Um, so I originally came up with two questions for my study. The first was, do resprouts and non-resprouts use the same water resources, which I hypothesized that they do? Um, in order to figure this out, I, this, I tried to determine if to the tissue samples of the plants um, or of the resprouts and non-resprouts have different delta D and different delta 18 O's. 
Um, meanwhile, I also asked if lignotubers can potentially serve as a water storage, which I hypothesized that they do. Um, and to, for, to figure this out, I had to determine if the burl and twig samples have different delta D and delta 18 out. Now, in order to do this, I uh, sampled that I sampled glandulosa at Pepperwood Preserve in Sonoma County. Um, and I sampled cores of the lignotuber, twigs and leaves. Um, along with soil and source waters, such as precipitation and well water, during three different sampling events. Once during a, the dry season, once during the rainy season, directly after a rain event, and once several weeks after a rain event. Um, and here we can see sort of uh, just a couple of like my field setup. Um, on the left, we see a lignotuber court, which originally had a lot of water in it, which made me a little bit excited in the beginning. Um, then I, uh, once I collected all of my samples, I went into the lab with maybe like the nerdiest looking lab setup ever. Um, and I, and I extracted water from all of my samples using a cryogenic vacuum distillation method. Um, I also decided to grind up some leaves for carbon and nitrogen isotope analysis, which I will get into later. Um, now in terms of the results here, we see at least, um, in terms of the differences between cores and twigs. Uh, we can see that there isn't really that much of a difference in terms of the delta 18 o However, with the hydrogen, there were some significant differences, um, at least for the first and the last sampling events when the, um, when the soil was a little bit drier, or at least like during a slightly drier season. Um, meanwhile, for the re-sprouts and the non-re-sprouts, um, looking at the cores specifically, or the lignotubers, there wasn't really any significant difference in between the water usage of, um, of the lignotubers. Uh, later, however, for the twigs, it looks like that there is a significant difference, especially during the dry season. Um, it looks like that they have, they have different isotopic ratios. However, um, during the more wet seasons, we can see that uh, the water usage becomes a lot more similar for the twigs. Um, now, in order to sort of understand what water sources that these, these plants might be using, um, we look at these, we look at the results in dual isotope space. So on the Y axis, we have the Delta 2H or the Delta Delta D. And on the X axis, we have the Delta 18 L. Now um, I've plotted a local meteoric water line, which is simply how um, the isotope, how the oxygen and hydrogen isotopes uh, will change within a local ecosystem. Um, and we can see that the precipitation and the well water both fall along that line. Um, however, uh, what we can note, we can, we can immediately see is that the soil actually is off of the line, which means that there's some sort of evaporative effect happening, which makes sense because um, water will evaporate off of the soil surface. And we can see that at least for the twigs, they actually also fall off of the line itself. They're, since they're underneath the line, that means that they also experience some sort of evaporative effect and can lead us to believe that the water that they use is not necessarily um, well water. Now, is it soil water? That's actually not totally sure for reasons I'll explain later, but um, at least we have a sort of idea that they, they might be using some soil water. The story is pretty similar with cores as well. Um, again, we can see that the uh, cores fall within, um, fall more closer to the, uh, closer to the soil. However, they are, the samples themselves are closer to the local meteoric water line than the twigs. Which means, that the, which means that the cores might be using a slightly different water source. They might be using some well water or, um, as I'll mention later, some rock moisture. Now, um, going, into, going into sort of what, we're, what we think or addressing the questions. Um, so while the water sources might be different, um, it's difficult to tell what sources the plants themselves are using. Um, it's also not entirely sure if the water sources themselves are different or not, since the only difference was really with the delta 2H of the of the twigs. Um, however, there were other confounding factors as well, at least with the dual isotope plot, in that I didn't actually measure all of the source waters. So there's potential that the plants could use rock moisture, which is water that is stored above the water table or above the well water, but below the soil. Um, and this is actually water that glandulosa can't access because of its deep roots. So it's something that in the future I would like to I would like to measure. Um, and then there's also potential for evaporation in the twig samples, which can artificially change um, the, the isotope ratios without actually reflecting changes in the water source and can sort of throw off the data. Um, this means that it's still not entirely sure. It looks like the, the re-sprouts and non-re-sprouts might use different water, especially during the dry season, but not. It, it's still unclear. This isn't like conclusive. Um, however, there, it looks like that the um, that there wasn't any difference between the twigs of resprouts, or there wasn't any difference in between um, cores and twigs. Um, 
which means that it looks like the lignin tubers probably don't serve at least as long-term water storage, especially considering that the differences that did exist could have, again, come from the um, evaporative effect um, of, the, of the twig samples and that the water may have artificially evaporated from them, which could have thrown off the, the ratios. Now, I also decided to do some carbon and nitrogen, nitrogen analysis of my leaves. Um, and as we can see, uh, the carb there is significant differences for both some really serious uh, some serious differences in the carbon and nitrogen isotope and isotopes in the in the leaves now what does this actually mean um, so when there's a when the, when there is a significant difference between the carbon that's with that's stored within a leaf this means that um, resprouts are discriminating less against uh, 13c um, which basically means that their stomata are more open and they're performing more photosynthesis photosynthesis this makes sense because re-sprouts are trying to grow really quickly after a fire. Um, and it, so it, it makes more sense that their stomata are open and they're really trying to push their, their, their growing process as fast as possible. This also means that they're slightly less water efficient, which is fine um, for them because the, at least the, the water, the, or the, the, the water was, or there was a decent amount of water in the system because of the rain events. Um, however, that could present problems in drought seasons. Um, specifically, they might not be able to grow as quickly. Meanwhile, um, with the what, with the delta fifteen n, um, again we saw a significant difference. And what this means is that resprouts might be accessing soil layers that are enriched with nitrogen. Um, as we can see, the resprouts are significantly less negative, and um, because fire actually can enrich nitrogen uh, soil nitrogen pools post fire, um, it seems like resprouts might be accessing that better than um, better than the non resprouts which is interesting because uh, roots will actually be, uh, upper soil roots will be destroyed post fire. So it's interesting to figure out where that nitrogen is coming from, um, or if the lignin tubers are potentially storing nitrogen and the, um, and the resprouts are potentially using that. Oh, sorry. Now, in conclusion, in regards to the specific questions that I asked, it looks like resprouts at different times or specifically during the dry season might be using different water sources than the non resprouts but we're still sort of unsure about what exact water sources they're using. Meanwhile, lignin tubers probably don't store water long term, um, although it's still unsure, and they could potentially st like store water in a short term is is what I'm potentially thinking. But I have yet to uh, have yet to study that. And meanwhile, cores and twigs definitely have different delta 13c and delta 15n, which has implications for their nutrient storage and uh, their nutrient usage post fire. Um, in the future. I would like to continue this project and um, definitely perform more replication, so more plants and more sites, while also incorporating a more temporal scale. So including um, or continuing the study over several years would be really interesting. Along with that, I'd like to capture all of the water sources, including fog, um, which I have already collected, but have not run through the mass spec yet, and rock moisture. And that is my presentation. Thank you to everyone that has helped me. Nicholas, thank you very much. We do have two questions, but unfortunately we're out of time. So in order to honor the amount of time the other folks have, if you would be so kind as to answer the questions uh, via typing, um, and then we can move on to our next presenter. Thanks very much, Nicholas. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, next we have Shreya, Shreya Garg, who is a microbial biology student and my student. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Shreya pre-recorded her um, presentation so because there's some internet issues, so we will have a recording but Tria is in attendance, so she will be able to answer any questions live afterwards. So uh, Craig is gonna go ahead and queue up Tria's video now. Hi everyone, my name's Tria, yeah, and for my honors <laughs> thesis okay. project, Great. I study susceptibilities of Ugandan plasmodium falciparum field isolates to novel proteasome inhibitors and the influences of genotypic differences to inhibitor susceptibility. This study was undertaken by the supervision of Phil Rosenthal at UCSF, and my CNR faculty sponsor was Professor Alameda. Going into a little bit of background, malaria is caused by the infectious agent Plasmodium and is a major health problem in Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and South America. Infections in Africa account for most cases and deaths globally. Most cases are due to the primary circulation of the most deadly parasite of the five Plasmodium species, Plasmodium falciparum. Current treatment recommendations by the World Health Organization are artemisinin-based combination therapies, but emerging resistance is threatening their use. Novel inhibitors are urgently needed. The proteasome is a eukaryotic protein degradation organelle 
is a promising new target for anti-malarial therapy. Novel proteasome inhibitors currently under development target the two catalytic, catalytic active subunits of the proteasome, the beta-2 and the beta-5 subunits. In considering these targets, it's important to assess the susceptibility of p falciparum from malaria endemic regions to proteasome inhibitors under study. We tested the ex vivo potency of experimental proteasome inhibitors against fresh clinical p falciparum isolates from the Tororo and Busia districts in Uganda from 2017 to 2020. In addition, previous studies have shown that lab strain parasites selected under proteasome drug pressure carried mutations in the catalytic beta-2, beta-5, and structural beta-6 subunits. These mutations conferred resistance to several proteasome inhibitors. Therefore, I wanted to analyze these subunits for genotypic differences among the Ugandan field isolates. The two questions I asked with my study were, are novel proteasome inhibitors active against field isolates? And can differences in inhibitor susceptibility be explained by genetic differences in the proteasome subunits of Ugandan field isolates? Starting off, I looked at the susceptibility of 15 different proteasome inhibitors in Ugandan isolates. I saw varied susceptibilities to all compounds, depicted here with the y-axis, um, which indicates the half maximal inhibitory concentration or the IC50 value, and each dot here represents a single isolate. The horizontal blue line indicates the median IC50 for the particular compound. As you can see, a number of compounds had several outliers with higher IC50s showing decreased drug susceptibility of these field isolates to proteasome inhibitors. Spearman correlations between the susceptibilities of isolates showed correlation across different compounds. And this is indicated by the R values here and the color scheme, um, a stronger red means a stronger positive correlation and blue means a negative correlation. Compounds were tested at different times in Uganda. And so the correlation matrices are divided based on the panels at different time points. And TDI-8304, a lead compound, was included in mul multiple panels and at different time points. So the strong correlation of these compounds points to a similar mechanism of action that might be influenced by genotypic differences in these field isolates. To further study the genotypic differences of the proteasome in these field isolates, I genotyped the beta-5 subunit, which is a proposed target of these compounds, and the beta-6 subunit, which is a structural subunit in the proteasome and adjacent to the beta-5 subunit active site. The schematics here show the two genes um, amplified by PCR. So I was able to genotype the whole gene for the beta-5 subunit. And for the beta-6 subunit, I focus on exon 4 because this is closely located to the beta-5 catalytic site. Previous studies in lab strains have shown that a mutation at position 117 in the beta-6 subunit impacts parasite susceptibility due to a conformational change and destabilizing effect on the beta-5 subunit binding pocket. And this is um, shown in the structural model right here. So this is the mutation at position 117 in the beta-6 subunit, and this is the beta-5 subunit right here. The Gondon field isolates that I genotype did not carry any mutations in the beta-6 subunit. I found three mutations in the beta-5 subunit in four isolates. There was a mutation at position two, which changed from valine to leucine, a mutation at position 142 will change from alanine to serine, and a mutation at position 150 will change from aspartic acid to glutamic acid. The only two mutations of importance were um, the mutation A142S and B150E, um, because these were present in the mature protein after autocatalytic cleavage. So we looked at the susceptibilities of these isolates in comparison to all isolates tested, and this is shown in the graphs here. So the um, dot in blue is the isolate with the um, 142 mutation, and the dot in red are the isolates with the 150 mutation. So the isolates with the A142S mutant um, showed median or slightly decreased susceptibility to the inhibitors, and the susceptibility of the D150E mutant isolates were high to median, but were in, within the normal range of the compound. So it's unlikely that the observed mutations have an impact on susceptibility to these proteasome inhibitors. Next, I looked at the beta-2 subunit, which is another target of several proteasome inhibitors. In addition, previous studies have shown that the inhibition of the beta-5 subunit has synergy with the inhibition of the beta-2 subunit. So I genotyped the beta-2 subunit of field isolates, and it's shown here in the schematic. Um, 
and these are the primers I use for amplification. So overall, I observed two mutations, a mutation at position 214 with a change from serine to phenylalanine, and a, position, a mutation at position 204 with a change from isoleucine to threonine. And these were observed in three isolates. So I compared susceptibilities of these mutant isolates to all wild-type isolates for three inhibitors, and again, I plotted the IC50 on the y-axis um, for each individual isolate, which is one dot. And as you can see here, the isolates with the IS214S mutation had decreased susceptibility to these two compounds. Um, and these are believed to inhibit the beta-2 and beta-5 subunits. Um, and as you can see, the, these isolates did not have uh, decreased susceptibility to the compound that only inhibits the beta-5 subunit, PDI8304. So to confirm this result in the beta-2 subunit that the S214S mutation leads to decreased susceptibility of isolates, I studied the susceptibility of these mixed field isolates to known beta-2 and beta-5 plus beta-2 inhibitors under lab conditions. After culture adaptation, only the S214S mutant parasite was viable and we were able to study the susceptibility of the full mutant and compare it to a field isolate without the mutation and the laboratory's um, chloroquine resistant strain W2. Very independently performed in vitro experiments revealed that the S214F mutant has a similar susceptibility to the inhibitors as the control parasites um, without the mutation and the W2 lab strain. So to further investigate the two mutations in the beta-2 subunit, we looked at the structural analysis of the beta-2 subunit. So the protein models revealed that the mutations are located in the C-terminal tail of the mature protein. So um, these mutations are shown in purple here, and this is a wild type, and this is our mutant. And the C-terminal tail of the beta-2 subunit actually wraps around another subunit, the beta-3 subunit, and the proteasome structure. So it's more of a structural component and not close to the active site, and so it would not influence inhibitor binding in the active site. So this confirms our previous laboratory results that the mutations are unlikely to influence susceptibility to any beta-2 inhibitors, and the observed decrease in susceptibility to inhibitors in the field isolates was most likely due to chance or other factors like proteasome expression. Overall, we observed various susceptibilities of the Ugandan isolates to 15 proteasome inhibitors, we identified no mutations in the beta-6 subunit. Mutations in the beta-5 subunit were not associated with decreased susceptibility to proteasome inhibitors. And beta-2 mutants showed decreased susceptibility in ex vivo assays, but in vitro assays did not confirm this, and structural analysis confirmed our in vitro assay results. It's unlikely that the decreased susceptibility in the beta-2 subunit mutants is caused by genetic differences, which is a good indicator that proteasome inhibitors could be future antimalarials. Future directions include investigating higher levels of expression of the proteasome, which has been shown to lead to resistance in mammalian cells. So it would be interesting to see and test isolates with a higher IC50 value for elevated expression of the proteasome and see if this is the case. And another direction would be investigating the ubiquitin regulatory protein in field isolates and looking at copy number variation. I quickly wanted to thank the members of the Rosenthal Lab at UCSF, Dr. Roland Cooper at Dominican University, and Dr. Laura Kirkman and Dr. Dang Lin at Cornell Medicine for their support and guidance throughout this entire year. In addition, I would like to thank Professor Alameda and the Spur Grant for their support throughout my project. Thank you. So any questions for Shreya can go straight to the Q&A, if any, please. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Jet. If, uh, if proteasome inhibitors are found to be antimalarial, like you're suggesting, what would be involved in um, scaling up that production to be used as an actual pharmaceutical? Yeah, so right now it's mainly been, um, as you saw, ex vivo assays. So there would be a lot of um, testing in mice, doing more kind of animal model um, studies, and then moving to larger clinical trials in Africa and looking at different sites around Africa as well, because there are five species of plasmodium. Um, plasmodium falciparum is the most severe. There's also plasmodium vivax that can cause malaria. So seeing how these um, proteasome inhibitor antimalarials translate to other um, strains as well in the field. 
Super cool, thank you. All right, thanks very much, Rio. Um, so we had scheduled a five to 10 minute stretch, stretch break at this point, but I think we might uh, be feeling up, good to go if Alex, if you're set up now. Yeah, sure. Sounds good. All right, so next we have Alex Gerogieva uh, from environmental science major. Take it away, Alex. Does this look fun? Yep, looks great. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Alex Yergiva and today I will be presenting my project on engineering reduced cyanogenic glucoside accumulation in cassava root, uh, where I have been working with Professor Stask Brian Staskowitz. Um, so to provide a brief overview of the presentation today, I'll start with a background about the importance of cassava as a staple crop and then address the importance of cyanogenic glucosides, which are metabolites found in cassava, uh, and then provide my experimental design and results as well as future work. Um, <clears throat> so cassava, uh, I personally wasn't familiar with it at all before I had started this project, but a fun little fact appropriate for the Berkeley crowd is that boba is actually made out of cassava. Um, aside from that, it's a major global food crop around the world, feeding approximately 800 million people in regions of Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific. Um, the issue is that the cassava plant contains cyanogenic glucosides, which are a toxic metabolite, um, and when consumed improperly by humans, can cause cyanide poisoning, Conzo disease, which is a paralytic disease affecting the limbs, uh, and this map pictured on the right shows the prevalence of Conzo disease in Africa, and even in the most extreme cases, death. Uh, so we would think if this uh, cyanogenic glucosides are toxic, why not just completely eradicate them from the plant uh, and make the crop safer for uh, consumption by humans, right? However, uh, previous literature has found that cyanogenic glucosides may be playing an important role in maintaining the physiological fitness of the cassava plant. Uh, so in periods of environmental stress, for example, drought, there's been a correlation with uh, increased concentration of cyanogenic glucosides. Additionally, they may be uh, providing as, serving as a herbivore defense mechanism and protecting from pest and pathogen attacks. So uh, this trend has been seen not only in cassava, but in sorghum, lima bean, white clover, and eucalyptus as well. Uh, so kind of the hypothesis that I developed is that if indeed cyanogenic glucosides are playing an important physiological role, then we should see a relationship between the amount of cyanogenic glucosides present in the plant and beneficial fitness factors such as yield. Um, and I wanted to explore this a little bit more. So I pulled a large data set from cassava base, which just contains information about uh, cassava cultivars from around the world. Uh, and I narrowed in on Nigeria and various cities in Nigeria. So one main city was Ibadan and Malam Maduri. And so we can see that indeed there is a trend as, as I had expected uh, with uh, hydrogen cyanide um, potential, which is equivalent to cyanogenic glucoside levels measured on a scale of zero to 10 uh, with the six to 10 category being the highest and the zero to three category being the lowest and uh, in relation to fresh storage root weight, which is equivalent to yield. Um, so with the higher cyanogenic glucoside content, there was higher yield, um, and this was for Nigeria as a whole. However, I wanted to see if this trend would um, hold in uh, more narrow uh, cities, for example. So I analyzed Ibadan, and again, we can see the, the positive relationship is present between yield and high cyanogenic glucosides, uh, and this holds in Milan Maduri as well. So a uh, quick recap, cassava is a major global uh, food crop feeding up a, about 800 million people around the world. However, it contains cyanogenic glucosides, which are toxic to humans, um, and but important for preserving the physiological fitness of the plant. So what we found in the literature was that these cyanogenic glucosides are synthesized in the leaves of the plant and then transported via the phloem into the root. Um, and this experiment on the left here was a stem girdling experiment that removed the vascular tissue in order to block transport and found that once transport was blocked, cyanogenic glucosides cannot travel through the foam and thereby accumulate in the leaves without being able to move to the roots. Um, 
And we wanted to find the gene that was responsible for this transport. So on the right, um, researchers had conducted a cyanogenic glucoside uptake assay. Uh, these are on the x-axis are all potential transporter candidate genes. Um, and prunicin and linamarin are two different cyanogenic glucosides. So they identified MECGTR1 as the target transporter gene, as it was the only gene that was able to uptake prunicin and linamarin in significant levels. Um, this led me into the hypothesis that I developed for this experiment, which was that by knocking out the cyanogenic glucoside transporter gene using CRISPR-Cas9, we should be able to eliminate transport, thereby decreasing the amount of cyanogenic glucosides in the roots while overaccumulating cyanogenic glucosides in the leaves thereby creating a crop that is safer for human consumption without eliminating crucial um, physiological fitness mechanisms. Uh, so once we sent our uh, CRISPR construct with a desired edit to the UC Berkeley plant transformation facility, they uh, transformed it into plants, into cassava plants and returned it back to us. Uh, and after we genotyped, we found that indeed the CRISPR-Cas9 editing of the target cyanogenic glucoside transporter was successful and had yielded one loss of function mutant plant shown here. So this is the uh, cassava gene map and the edit was present in the exon one region of the genome created by guide two. So guide two had cut at this target um, cyanogenic glucoside transporter gene, thus rendering uh, the gene inoperative and knocking out its function. Um, and then on the bottom here, we have uh, the gene uh, sequence for this edited plant, which is essentially identical to wild type, except for this one base pair T insertion right after the cut site upstream of the PAM. Um, so the resulting homozygous uh, mutant plant had an insertion deletion rate of 99%. Um, and I took some pictures of it here. You can see this was it as a baby and then throughout its growth stages. And this is roughly what it looks like now. Um, <clears throat> so. In conclusion, we found that cyanogenic glucosides are likely playing an important physiological role um, and that the CRISPR-Cas9 mediated editing of the target transporter gene was successful. So this should allow us to create uh, cassava plants that are safer for human consumption without eliminating important fitness mechanisms. Um, and the next steps would be to assay the cyanogenic glucoside levels of the mutant plants and determine if there is, is indeed a reduction in cyanogenic glucoside levels of the roots while an overaccumulation in the leaf. Uh, and I started working on this yesterday actually and will continue on it in the coming weeks. Um, and then eventually far after I'm gone and graduated, we would hope to do in-field testing of these edited lines and determine their viability in real world environmental conditions. Um, so I would like to quickly thank Nicholas, my amazing mentor, as well as Professor Brian Staskwitz and the rest of the lab, uh, as well as the SPUR grant for providing funding for this project, um, MJ and Baljeet, who helped a lot with the transformations, Jessica and Michael for providing a lot of cassava wisdom, as well as the uh, environmental science senior thesis team, uh, Professor Tina Mendez, Kyle Leslie, and my classmates who were essential in the thesis writing process. Um, so thank you all for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, Alex, thanks very much. We do have a question. Uh, what was the most challenging part you experienced throughout this project? Um, <clears throat> I think one thing that I hadn't realized going into this work is how long plants take to grow. Um, and I thought that I would completely be done measuring the cyanide levels in the roots and the leaves by now. However, I still have to wait for these plants to develop before I can uh, get this data. So I think that was one thing. And also just being able to care for the plants and keep them alive uh, was one kind of more unexpected challenge. Fantastic. I'll also chime in to say, if anybody is in Berkeley, I'm like 95% sure that Berkeley Bowl has cassava flower if anybody wants to play with it, so. All right, thanks very much, Alex. Um, we are going to move on to our next presenter, Haley Grimmer, also one of my students, genetics and plant biology major. Haley, go ahead and take it away. Hi, um, let's see, here we go, share. And I just saw the present, oh, here we go, okay. 
Okay, so hi, my name is Hanley Grimmer. I work in the Macro System Ecology Lab under Dr. Benjamin Blonder. And um, the project I've been currently working on is the design principles of uh, evolved transportation networks in leaf veins. More specifically, this is actually a, a huge project. So I have been working on one small subset and testing leaf mechanical traits of our species. So we actually have five different objectives for this project, but the one that I mainly focus on is to assess any empirical evidence for vein network mediated trade-offs through functions, cost measurements for our species. Um, these mechanical traits are super important because they influence the lifespan of leaves. And these traits have an ecological impact because they affect any decomposition for leaf litter which can greatly affect any ecosystems. So we are actually working in the greenhouse right across the street from the botanical gardens, which makes it great because we we're able to use the botanical gardens to get our species. So far, we have uh, sampled 36 species and gotten 34 uh, families, but our overall end goal is to sample all 286 families that are non-threatened vascular plants in the botanical garden. So what I have been doing is I test the strength and re the resistance of all of our leaf samples. Um, the resistance is defined as any ability to avoid any physical damage that would come from external factors such as abrivery or environmental conditions. And uh, strength is a physical ability to deploy a network in space, which is related to the stiffness of the leaf. Um, to test these, different uh, factors. I am using a universal testing machine, which is great because it allows me to both test the force and the distance traveled of the, te of the testing machine, along with uh, it allows me to have a diverse set of different fixtures that I can attach to it so I can run all my tests on one machine. And here I am in the garden uh, with my machine testing the leaf. So before I go over into how I test both the resistance and the strength, uh, I wanted to go briefly touch on two factors of the leaf that we test, and that is the lamina and the midrib. Um, to test these two different parts of the leaves, we do punch, shearing, and bending tests. And at first, we didn't realize that there was going to be a distinct difference between the midrib and the lamina. But after closely examining our data, we realized that there is a stark difference that you'll see later on um, between the midrib and the lamina, more specifically and more obviously seen in the punching tests that we do. So the punching test consists of a thin metal rod that is attached to the universal testing machine. And um, I have my leaf in place and basically I lower this rod down until it creates a hole in whatever part of the leaf that I'm testing. Um, as you can see on the left hand side, these curves show the uh, force displaced when we do these tests. And if you can see the um, values at the peaks, the top two would represent when we punch the lamina versus the midrib. And they have much higher, about five, 10 times higher than the lamina, um, which would be on the bottom here. So to show these results, I chose to um, create graphs of the mean strength and the mean specific work for both the lamina and the midrib. Um, as you can see, there's a slight correlation between the mean strength of the lamina and the mean strength of the midrib but not much for the mean specific work. And that was quite surprising for me. I also created box plots to show that there's a huge difference between the uh, punch strength and punch specific work for the midrib versus the lamina. And so we also had to alter um, our protocol. And normally we run three tests. We run each test three times on each species. But since we discovered that there's this big difference between the lamina and the midrib, 
for the punch test specifically, we decided to change it to two where we punch through the lamina and two when we punch through the midrib. And you can see that there's this big difference between the two. The sharing test consists of a blade that cuts it transversely across the leaf. Um, and this allows us to get the force it takes to shear across the lamina and the midrib in one uh, smooth test. And the curves on the left would show that, so there's these smaller peaks, which represents when the leaf is being cut through the lamina. And then this very, very obvious sharp peak is when it cuts through the midrib. So for these results, again, for the mean strength, there is a slight correlation. I thought it would be bigger, but maybe once we test more species, it will become more evident. Um, and the mean specific work is still no correlation. For these box plots, um, at first when looking at, I was, I expected for mean shear strength to look like that, but at first I was puzzled looking at mean shear specific work. And after consulting with my advisor um, on this project, we realized that because the mean specific work takes into account the distance that the blade cuts across, um, for the lamina, there is a much greater distance to cut across versus the midrib. And so that's why uh, this, these values are kind of flipped from what I expected them to be. The bending test is a little bit different. Um, it tests the strength of the leaf and um, it is similar to, but not quite the same as Young's modulus of elasticity. We test both the midrib or we test the whole leaf and the lamina. Um, and as you can see, we get these nice smooth curves for our tests. Um, this test has been quite tricky sometimes because depending on the size of the leaf, not always can we get a good cut of the lamina. And so some of our species, we were not able to test the banding, bending of just the lamina. Um, additionally, some of the lamina was so thin that the universal testing machine did not pick up any pressure exerted on the leaf at all. So for my results, um, I chose to show the mean flexural elasticity for the whole leaf and the lamina, which like I said, is very similar, but not exactly the same as the uh, Young's modulus of elasticity. There's a very tiny correlation um, and again, there is on average a higher uh, mean flexural elasticity for the whole leaf versus the lamina because it includes the midrib. I also wanted to look at the relationship between tests. Um, this also surprised me because I expected to have a stronger correlation between the uh, punch strength and shear strength, but um, like I said, I believe once we have more species tested, it will become way more apparent. I also uh, wanted to show the punch strength and shear strength uh, against the flexural, mean of flexural elasticity. Um, and this didn't surprise me as much that there wasn't as much correlation, but I still think that there will be a larger one in the future. So going forward, uh, obviously we want to increase representation between clades and add more families and continue our sampling. Also, we want to try and connect these mechanical traits with how um, the venation patterns of leaves, how they affect these mechanical traits. And to do this, we will stain our leaf samples and create a high resolution image of the leaf. And then using a program on MATLAB called Leaf Vein CNN, we're able to extract the venation patterns and any data associated with the venation patterns. And we'll be able to compare these venation patterns against the mechanical traits that we have been acquiring. 
Thank you guys for listening. I'd like to thank my UCBG trait campaign team um, and my faculty advisor, more specifically, um, Eleni Matos, because obviously I wouldn't be able to do this without her. Um, and they've made it such a fun experience and I am so grateful to have them in my life. Thank you. Thank you. If anyone in the audience would have any questions, um, you can type it in the Q&A feature, please. I have a fun quick question for Haley. What is your all-time favorite leap shape? <laughs> Not scientific, but just a good question. That's a great question. It's funny because I was talking about this uh, in the lab yesterday, how we definitely start to favor <laughs> certain leaves over others because they're easier to test. So like my ideal leaf to test is one that is long and um, somewhat thinny or somewhat thin or skinny um, versus like a larger leaf because it's very hard to, uh, I guess, pin it down correctly. Um, yeah, and very small leaves obviously are also super hard to test. But yeah, you definitely start like to favor. Is a eucalyptus leaf that's like long and thin? Is that is that the ideal? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Excellent, <laughs> thanks. All right, folks, and thanks to Haley. Um, our next presenter is Gabriela Deliasco from the Molecular Environmental Biology major, presenting along with Veronica Paul from the Conservation Conservation Resource Studies major. Hello, my name is Veronica Paul. And I'm Gabriela Giliasco. And today we are going to be presenting on low flow effects on aquatic macroinvertebrates in Sierra Nevada streams. Climate change is expected to change snowmelt timing. Specifically in the Sierra Nevadas, the median runoff is expected to advance by up to two months by the year 2080. Unmitigated climate change will cause peak runoff to shift to January and February. As seen in the figure, runoff currently peaks in May and June, which are indicated by the larger circles, but by the end of the century with climate change, runoff would peak in January, eight weeks earlier. These early low flows may affect both abiotic and biotic components of the ecosystem. The biotic components of the ecosystem are defined here as aquatic macroinvertebrate community compositions. Macroinvertebrates are indicator species for water quality and are thus useful in studying the health of the ecosystem. Changes resulting from low flow that affect macroinvertebrates include reduced habitat size, an associated increase in predator density, and more concentrated pollution. Other changes include less dissolved oxygen, less material flowing down the stream for collector gatherers, and the potential for more fine sediment to accumulate. So our main research question is, do early low flows harm sensitive aquatic macroinvertebrates? And additionally, within these overarching questions are three sub-questions. The first being, how does early low flow affect abiotic components of ecosystems? Two, does early low flow reduce flatworm and elmidae abundance in proportion to community? And three, does early low flow affect their size? So the two invertebrates that we'll be focusing on are elmidae and flatworms. Both of these macroinvertebrates are indicators of water quality as well as water conditions. For elmidae to live, they require water that's nearly saturated with dissolved oxygen. They are incredibly sensitive to any human actions that reduce oxygen concentrations. As a result, they're useful indicators of climate change. Uh, flatworms breathe through their skin, which results in them being indicators of reduced oxygen and water quality as well. Temperatures also have significant impacts on flatworm development and reproduction. So both macroinvertebrates are likely to respond to low flow treatments and to what extent is what we're attempting to measure. In terms of the project design, there are nine flow through channels located in Mono County at the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Laboratory. This site has a man-made experimental stream system with nine channels that are all connected to Convict Creek. As you can see from the figure on the upper right, there were three flow treatments each assigned to three channels. The first flow treatment was current conditions, which returns to a low flow on August 3rd. The second flow treatment was a mitigated climate change scenario, which returns to a low flow three weeks earlier than August 3rd. And the third flow treatment was an unmitigated climate change scenario, which returns to a low flow six weeks earlier than August 3rd. This graph demonstrates how flow changed over the course of the experiment. The black line represents average flow in Convict Creek. 
The green dashed lines represent times when insects were sampled from the streams. The yellow line depicts how flow changes currently, and the red line depicts how flow could look by the year 2080, a return to low flow six weeks earlier. Low flow is the state to which things return after snowmelt. If snowmelt occurs earlier, as it would under unmitigated climate change in the six week treatment, low flow would then extend for longer. We will not be addressing the three week treatment, which is the orange line in the macroinvertebrate data. One sample was collected from each channel at each sample date. This was a composite sample of two riffle servers and one pool server to ensure that one sample represented the entire stream reach. Insects were identified to the lowest reasonable taxonomic resolution, usually the genus or species level. Additionally, each individual's length was measured in millimeters using a reticle. A repeated measures NOVA test was then used to compare means across variables based on our repeated observations. The variables analyzed were size, abundance, and fraction of the community. So here are results from sub-question one, how does early low flow affect abiotic components of ecosystems? So this graph portrays the mean daily discharge where Q represents the volume flow rate in liters per second and the dotted lines represent three week intervals. The portion of the graph near zero, just seen here before June and also after August, represents the low flow. So this flow data graph shows the different durations of low flow. The control channel does not return to low flow until August, whereas the six week treatment returns to base flow in mid June. This early return to low flow is associated with an increased low flow duration in the six week treatment. So this increased duration is in turn associated with water depth and velocity both being reduced as flow is the product of the depth, the width and the velocity of water. So this graph portrays the maximum hourly temperature per day following the same time scale. Evidently, flow treatment is also directly influencing the thermal stress that the organisms experience. So during the time frame where the six week treatment is experiencing early low flows from mid June to August, uh, there's an associated increase in maximum water temperature of up to 10 degrees Celsius. So when flows converge in August, thermal regimes also become synchronous. An additional note, although not expressed in this data, is that increased fine sediment was qualitatively observed. Now we will go into our results for sub question two, which was does early low flow reduce flower and almidae abundance in proportion to community? Each increasing sample number on the x-axis represents a sample taken at a later date. Looking at our results, we find that almidae abundance was not significantly impacted by float treatment or sample. There was no change over the course of the summer. Flatworm abundance, however, on the other hand, was significantly impacted by flow treatment. There was an increase in abundance of flatworms with early low flow, especially towards the end of the experiment. Late in the season, around sample five, you can see all three of the advanced low flow treatments, which are the red line, show an increase in flatworm abundance during late season low flow compared to current conditions, which are the blue line, where low flow is only just being reached and such significant increases in abundance are not seen. So the fraction of LME day in the total community was not significantly tied to treatment and they also showed no response. Flatworm proportion to community, however, was significantly impacted by treatment. Again, later in the experiment here on sample five, advanced low flow treatments show on average a higher fraction of flatworms in the community as compared to the current treatments uh, in the blue line. So this can be related to the significant increase in abundance that was previously shown. The increase in abundance on flatworms was on average greater than any potential increase in abundance of other taxa in the community as the flatworm fraction of community was able to increase. If other species also increased in abundance to a similar extent, there would not be a significant result showing the relative proportion of flatworms in the community to increase. Now we'll go into our results for sub-question three, which is does early low flow affect flatworm and elmidae size? It was found that there was no significant change in size for elmidae in response to the treatments. There was also no significant effect on size for flatworms. So why is this important? These results have implications for Sierra Nevada food webs where flatworms and elmidae play a role as both predator and prey. Firstly, the results show elmidae to be resilient members of the community that do well in low flow. In the face of climate change, they can still survive without any negative consequences that we could see. The lack of adverse effects on elmidae show that they may be a source of stability for the food web in a changing climate. Uh, also based on these results, flatworms seem to do well with low flow conditions. The increase in flatworm abundance will likely be associated with them exerting a stronger predation pressure. Most flatworms are carnivores and they feed on tiny aquatic invertebrates such as rotifers, small crustaceans, and other worms. If these prey do not also respond positively to low flows, they may face adverse consequences as a result of this increased predation pressure. 
Not only that, but organisms metabolism and therefore their predation activity increases with warmer conditions. So as temperatures increase with low flow, predators such as flatworms would become more active. The base of the food web, which is defined here as smaller aquatic invertebrates, may be adversely affected by these changes in flatworm communities. So overall, flatworms play a crucial role in the food web as they link the tiny microscopic members of the stream community to the larger predators such as fish, crayfish, and aquatic insects by being the predator of the former and the prey of the latter. So the abundance of flatworms may have far-reaching effects. These bottom-up impacts may eventually reach terrestrial components of the food web, such as the birds that feed on the fish in the stream. In conclusion, climate change will alter community composition and in turn affect the larger food web and species interactions. We would like to take this time now to thank Kyle Leathers, who is our primary mentor, and Professor Albert Ruhi. We would also like to thank the UC Berkeley undergraduates involved in the project through Europe and SPUR who assisted in sorting the samples. Funding for this study and subsequent analysis is provided by the Sequoia Parks Conservancy through the Sequoia Science Learning Center Research Grant, the ESPM Department, and the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Lab. Now we'll take this time to answer any questions. If anybody has any questions, please submit in the Q&A feature. Okay, thanks very much, Gabriella and Veronica. Very, very much appreciate your presentation. Um, okay, so next we have another one of my students, Jet Liu, who I would also like to congratulate for being the department and major winner of the Citation Prize this year. So congratulations, Jet. Go ahead and uh, present, please. Thanks so much, Patricia. Uh, hey, everyone, I'm Jet. I'm a graduating senior and the microbial biology major. I'm also a member of the Banfield Lab. And today I'd like to talk about how I used CRISPR-Cas systems to identify and characterize phage infecting ultra-small bacteria. So the ultra-small bacteria I'm gonna be talking about today are candidate phyla radiation or CPR bacteria. And they're super fascinating. So on my screen, I have Laura Hugg's new tree of life. And if you look on the top right, top right hand side of the tree, that small green sliver is all the eukaryotes. So all the animals, all the plants, all the fungi in the world. And then the rest of the tree, you have archaea, you have bacteria, and then you have this massive purple branch. And those are all CPR bacteria. So CPR bacteria are thought to comprise between 25 and 50% of all diversity on the planet. And they're really interesting because they're ultra small. So they're about one tenth the size of typical bacteria. They have extremely limited metabolisms. And that allows them to live this um, crazy lifestyle as episymbionts. So they actually live on the cell surface of other bacteria and sort of parasitize off of those larger bacteria. So in this picture I have in the top right-hand side, if you look in that red sphere, that rod-shaped bacteria is what we typically think of a bacteria. And then where the arrow is pointing, that tiny gray speck is a CPR bacteria living on uh, the cell surface of that larger bacteria. And aside from what I've told you, uh, CPR bacteria are really enigmatic and not much is known about them. So with this project, I wanted to first ask what sort of CRISPR-Cas systems are present in CPR bacteria. And then I also wanted to talk about these guys, which are bacteriophage, essentially viruses that infect bacteria. And I wanted to see what sort of phage infects CPR bacteria. So now that I talked a little bit about CPR bacteria, I wanted to um, explain how we can use CRISPR-Cas systems to establish phage relationships. And so I think the term CRISPR-Cas system is synonymous with gene editing right now, but it's also um, found in nature as a bacterial immune response. And the way it works is that CRISPR-Cas systems contain these small sequences or spacers that can um, pair with phage genomes. And then the CRISPR-Cas system can destroy the phage genome before it has the chance to damage the cell. And so knowing the way that the CRISPR-Cas systems work, if, we, if a bacteria has a CRISPR-Cas system and we find that one of its sequences or its spacers matches with the phage genome, we can say that that phage infects a bacteria. And that's how we establish relationships between phage and bacteria using CRISPR-Cas systems. So I also just wanna run briefly through the workflow I used for this project. And I started with a database of high quality CPR genomes. 
I identified CRISPR-Cas systems in those genomes. I extracted the spacers or phage sequences from those CRISPR-Cas systems, and I matched them to large phage databases to predict which phage were infecting CPR bacteria. And before I jump into results, um, I also just want to give some context on uh, the, the CPR database we used. So we had a total of 864 CPR genomes. And we, uh, in, in, in that database, we specifically selected three different types of CPR bacteria, Sakari so bacteria, Gracilli bacteria, and Abscondida bacteria, because they're found in a wide array of environments. Out of those 864 CPR genomes, we identified 74 genomes that contain complete CRISPR-Cas systems. So if you look at this plot I've included on the y or sorry, on the x-axis, I have the different types of CPR bacteria, Gracilli bacteria, Sakari bacteria, Abscondida bacteria, and then each point on the graph represents a complete CRISPR-Cas system. And on the y-axis, I've included the number of spacers in each CPR array. And we're interested in the number of spacers because um, the greater number of spacers that a CRISPR-Cas system has, potentially the more phage infect that bacteria. And just to talk about how we um, defined what a complete CRISPR-Cas system was, we look, I look for a full suite of Cas proteins and then also a spacer array. So once I identified CRISPR-Cas systems in these CPR bacteria, I extracted spacers, and as I mentioned, I, I matched them to large phage, phage databases. And fortunately, we actually found a large number of phage that infects CPR bacteria, 529 in total. And so in this other plot, um, again on the x-axis, I've included the different types of CPR bacteria. And then each point on this plot represents a phage we found that infects CPR bacteria. And the y-axis, we have the phage length um, in addition, out of these 529 phage, we found 36 that were fully circularized, essentially complete phage genomes, and were not fragmented at all. Uh, once, I, you know, once I found these, these CPR infecting phage, we wanted to characterize them. And in some of them, I found this really interesting aspect. And that was that some of these CPR infecting phage were alternatively coded compared to their CPR host. Um, and so what does alternatively coded mean? Well, it, specifically refers to the translation step of the central dogma going from mRNA to protein. Oops. And so if you look at this translation table, this is what we typically think of um, translation table for almost all bacteria in IKEA. And this takes you from codon to amino acid. But there's some, you know, alternatively coded translation tables. Um, this is an example. And this only has one change. And it's a change in the stop codon to a glycine. And while that change can, seems minor, it can actually have a profound impact in the way that proteins are translated. And this was really uh, surprising to find in CPR phage um, when they're alternatively coded compared to their host. When we think about the phage life cycle, because we know that CPR, we know that that phage replicate by using host machinery. And so, if CPR phage are alternatively coded compared to their hosts, it raises the question: How are their proteins being translated correctly if they're using host machinery? We don't really have an answer for that right now, but that's definitely something we want to look into further, and it's, it's a pretty surprising result. Um, and the last result I want to talk about today is how we looked at if these CPR infecting phage are also infecting other bacteria. So on the screen, I have the workflow I presented earlier. And then to see if these phage were infecting other bacteria, I took a two-pronged approach. First, I compiled a large comprehensive bacterial database. I identified CRISPR-Cas systems in that database, I extracted spacers, and I matched them to these CPR phage. And then I also took um, public comprehensive spacer databases and I directly matched them to CPR, these CPR infecting phage we identified. And what we found were that one type of CPR bacteria, Sakari bacteria, was infected by a phage that also infected actinomyces, which is a known host of Sakari bacteria. In addition, we found that at Another type of uh, CPR bacteria, Gracilli bacteria, was infected by a phage that also infected Fusobacteria, which is a potential host for CPR bacteria. And so while the number of hits were low, um, we could be talking about the sort of relationship I've drawn here in which CPR bacteria are living on the surface of larger bacteria, modulating those population, those bacterial populations. And then we also have phage that infect both the CPR bacteria and the larger bacteria and modulate those, those populations. So just to sort of recap what I've talked about, 
first seafloor bacteria are ultra small bacteria that might comprise up to 50% of all diversity on the planet. In those seafloor bacteria, using a database we compiled, I identified CRISPR-Cas systems. I used those CRISPR-Cas systems to link, um, to find phage that infect CPR bacteria, some of which were alternatively coded. And then I also looked into this linkage between CPR bacteria, their hosts, and their phage. And if this linkage is true, that sort of triad relationship just adds another layer of complexity as we continue to decipher these microbial community dynamics. Um, finally, I just wanna give a big thank you to Professor Banfield for all of her support, and Alex Jaffe for his mentorship, and uh, just everyone in the lab for being super, uh, super helpful and really welcoming. Um, thank you guys so much for the opportunity and also thank you for listening to my talk. Any questions? Amazing, thank you, Jet. We'll wait and see if any questions come in the chat or the Q and A. Sorry. Gotcha. Cool. Okay. Well, cool. if any come in, then I'll let you. Uh, you can type out your answers too. But yeah, Great, thanks thank a lot. You. Really appreciate thank it. You. Yeah. All right. And before we get to our next presenter, I just want to do a brief um, shout out to, so a lot of the folks presenting today um, have either partaken in the honors program, uh, our SPUR program, which is sponsored projects for undergraduate research, uh, or the travel grant, which is another uh, Rouser College exclusive opportunity. Um, I'm just going to link uh, there in the chat to these different programs so you can see what these students have been involved in. Um, some students are just doing it for the level of research, which we also very much appreciate. Um, but uh, yeah, so these are just various opportunities of, of how these students have gotten involved in research um, in our community and then got connected with faculty to do um, this fantastic work. So um, moving on, uh, we have Silver Dushi, who is a microbial biology major. And we will pass the baton to you, Silver Du. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Looks great. Um, yes, thank you. So uh, my project is spray-induced silencing of grape polyrimidule genes to reduce polyrimidule growth. So I'm uh, currently working in Professor Wildermuth lab under the plant and microbial biology department. So polyrimidule have a great economic <laughs> agriculture. They infect a great variety of species. Uh, so polyrimidule will cause reduced photosynthesis um, post, uh, resulting like leading to lower yields or uh, an off color. And a uh, specific polyrimidule infects specific types of plants. So to develop a uh, uh, sixth method, we turn to the Arabidopsis uh, go on um, this model system to optimize for the grip model. So grip produced in, uh, produced in California are going to three main categories, wine grapes, table grapes, and raisin grapes. So these three categories make up an industry that contributed over 3.9 billion in California. <clears throat> and polyamidu is also responsible for nearly 89% of pesticides used for grape growers in California, yeah. So polyrimidule is the most significant disease of grape. If left untreated, it will cause dramatic losses in yield and good quality. So right now, uh, polyrimidule can be controlled to a certain extent by fungicides, but there are also some caveats about the fungicides that are currently being used, uh, such as uh, the great cost of the fungicide application, and fungicides need to be apply regularly to prevent disease from emerging because it is hard to control once it emerges. Also, polyrimidule resistance is developing against current fungicides. And also the environmental and health concerns such as the sulfur in the current fungicides. So uh, new drugs to combat fungal infections are urgently needed. So we need to, first of all, understand different stages of polyrimidu infection. So polyrimidu fungi are obligate fungal biotopes, meaning that they can only grow on living plant tissue and they obtain their nutrients from living cells. 
of their plants or host plants in order to complete their life cycle. So the life cycle begins with a spore landing on the leaf surface and within, within a few hours it germinates and it pierces through the plant cell wall to the entire tissue and then it will develop a, a specialized seeding structure called hostorium and they and then they will reproduce on the top of plants and make this reproductive structure. Um, so free induced gene silencing or six is an emerging tech technology where we introduce uh, outside double-stranded RNA by spraying directly on the plant to inhibit um, gene expression in target organisms. So six has been shown to be effective against a diverse organism, including fungi in laboratory settings. And commercial products are also being developed, but nothing is available yet. Um, so how does this work? So it works by RNA interference, uh, where we make a double-stranded DNA RNA product that sprays and that goes into the polymer with you. Uh, it is chopped into this smaller RNA and forms a complex, which then results in cleavage of the messenger RNA. And then because the uh, mRNA is cleaved, it cannot make protein, which would then result in loss of function, functional phenotype. Mm. So um, how do we do this? As I told you, we have to have grape wine and the powder module. So we actually start with a uh, hard cutting and we place the hard cutting in the midstage for six weeks for it to uh, lose it, for it to sprout. And then we need to pot and place them in greenhouse for eight weeks. And then they, were, they will be ready for experiments. And I'll, I have also been really involved in maintenance of this, which includes constant pruning applications of pesticides and fertilizers. And remember that modern reduce are obligate biotopes. So in order to maintain modern reduce, we have to keep infecting the plants and keep them isolated so that we have modern reduce for infection. So uh, the first step of the experiment is to select genes and design RNA. Um, so we select genes based on comparative genomics uh, like there are online database like mycocosm and also we select genes based on expression data that our lab has sequenced and there are also no metab uh, metabolic pathways and biological processes that we uh, also get information from. Um, so in order to um, for the assessment of the double stranded RNA their impact on the current module growth. So we first will inoculate the plants or detach leaves with current module spores. And then we will spray the plants or the detached leaves with uh, the double-stranded RNA we select and prepare. And then we will, um, we will um, evaluate the current module growth and reproduction by either uh, by visualization and counting the spores on the micro uh, under the microscope. So here are the, uh, some results that I have been doing over this uh, over this. Course. So the protocols have been uh, optimized by Dr. Taneja uh, using CYP51 against non genes that is required for polymer uh, development. So CYP51 is a key enzyme of the sterile biosynthesis pathway. So, uh, so it has been shown that after spraying the double-stranded targeting, double-stranded RNA targeting this CYP51 gene, the plasma membrane integrity will be disturbed uh, and which will result in leaky membrane and leads to the death, death of polymer dew. So this CYP51 protein is uh, currently a target for uh, while they use BMI uh, fungicide. So, and we also have predicted this others, as you can see in our experiments, in those in, er, those in early development and modification of 
plant processes have the most dramatic impact in their spore production. So for early developments, these two genes are expressed at early stage of infection and predicted to have functions in supporting early development of polymodule. Um, and for modification of plant processes, uh, these are predicted to go into the host plants and manipulate the host immune system um, and, or the plant's metabolis uh, metabo metabolism to support its own growth. So in general, six out of seven polymodule genes uh, targeted via six methods result in significant reduction of polymodule infection of group one. So our final goal is actually to develop a new fungicide to control polymodule in group one using six technology via RNAi. So, so for this new, this kind of new fungicide, since we only got RNA, uh, which is a natural component of the environment, so it's not toxic and can readily be degraded in the environment. And th this is also biological and non-transgenic. And, and since we can design specific RNA fungicides, that's very limited of targets. And so since the sequence is very specific. So um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Spur and, Prof and Professor Rudamuth, and particularly my, my mentor, Dr. Taneja, which helps me a lot. So yes, thank you. For Silverdew, also hi Silverdew, nice to see you. <laughs> if any come in, Silver, you can go ahead and just answer them in the via typing in the Q and A. And thank you very much for presenting. Okay, thank you. Okay, next we have Blake Stoner Osborne from the Molecular Environmental Biology major. Blake, take it away. Blake, not sure if you're speaking, but we can't hear you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Hello, my name is Blake, and today I'll be presenting my honors thesis, which is sort of like modern day Jurassic Park. I use DNA metabarcoding to reconstruct mosquito feeding networks across the state of California. All right, so remember Jurassic Park. The scientific premise here was that biologists found mosquitoes from the Jurassic period trapped in amber. These mosquitoes allegedly fed on dinosaurs and the dinosaur DNA was preserved in the DNA gut contents. Now, while science isn't quite to the point of using remnant DNA to clone dinosaurs, blood from inside mosquito guts actually does contain DNA from their prey that we can work with. Sadly, I won't be cloning and revitalizing the dinosaurs, but I was able to use prey DNA to reconstruct mosquito feeding networks across the state of California. I used a DNA identification method called DNA metabarcoding, which is basically the process of taking DNA from an organism and matching it to a known DNA sequence in a sort of library database. So imagine you go to the grocery store and you pick out a tub of strawberries. You go up to the register, you scan those strawberries and it shows up on the screen. Now it showed up because the database at the grocery store knows that the barcode for the strawberries is meant to be strawberries. This is kind of the same idea, but for a biological premise. If you have DNA from say a mouse and you put it through a database that will match that DNA to an organism's DNA, the database will spit back out that you in fact were working with a mouse. So I use the same concept to take mis mis uh, blood from mosquito gut contents to match it to prey DNA. So the research process for this process, which is called DNA metabarcoding, is you start with field collection, you get your mosquitoes, you extract the blood from the mosquito stomachs. Uh, from that blood, you then extract the DNA. You can amplify the DNA and then send it through those databases to get back the prey organisms. So what I ended up doing here was uh, I 
took mosquitoes from all across Northern and Southern California. And I was going to compare um, if there are significant differences in diet between the mosquitoes found in Northern California versus Southern California. My hypothesis was that the diet would vary significantly because the climates in Northern and Southern California are actually very different. Um, and I expected you to have different mosquito species and different prey species from there. Uh, in my studies, I ended up collecting about 14 different species of mosquitoes, which led me to a different question, which was, oops, sorry, which led me to a different question, which was, is the diet between uh, all these different species going to be significantly different? And it will vary by genus and by species. So my hypothesis was that they would in fact vary significantly between them because different organisms fill different niches. And of course that would correlate to different diets as well. So this is where my process started. I started in the Bay Area and I went out to a bunch of different um, spots to go collect mosquitoes. I used a tool called an aspirator, which you can see in the uh, picture in the far left. It's this little tube right here that uh, is attached to a container so you can suck up the mosquitoes. Um, there was a resting trap. So they would go feed and then sit in the resting trap and then you can close it and extract them. Uh, and the last one was I used mosquito nets for that as well. I was out there for about two months and very quickly realized I was not going to get enough samples that I needed. So I ended up getting bailed out by a professor at the University of the Pacific who was kind enough to loan me samples. Her name's Dr. Tara Tiamen, and she had samples from the last 10 years from all across California. So the next thing that I did after I had those collected mosquitoes is I took them, I basically crushed them and got the blood out of their um, systems. And then from there, I followed DNA extraction protocols to just get the DNA out and get rid of all the proteins and the RNA that aren't needed. From there, I used a uh, polymerase chain reaction, which is also known as PCR, to amplify that DNA and get a ton of copies of it. And then from there, you can check that your DNA amplified. Uh, you can see these bars uh, in the middle that are prominent black bars. That's the check to make sure that the DNA actually amplified. And then I send it off to get sequenced. And from there, you can see there's a peak around 434 base pairs, which was my target region. So I know that the DNA did actually amplify. So I basically, in the research process, I am now at that barcoding stage. Due to COVID, I was not able to go into the lab for extended periods of time on and off. Um, so results are forthcoming, stay tuned, but I do expect to see variation in diet composition by both species and location. And lastly, I'd like to just thank um, everyone who helped me out with this project, including Tara Tiamen and um, Eric Haas Stapleton, who works at the Alameda Mosquito Abatement Center. Um, and I'd like to thank my research mentors, Natalie Graham and George Roderick. Um, and I'd like to also thank the Walker Fund and the Spur Grant for funding this project. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Blake. Um, if anyone has any uh, questions, now would be the time to send it to the Q&A portion. Thank you. And just a note, uh, oh, here we go. Uh, so does your DNA barcoding pick up any microbes? Is a question for one of our other presenters. Yeah, that's a great question. So basically the uh, primer sequence that I use to amplify the DNA, it's only from vertebrates. So basically these mosquitoes, they typically feed on vertebrates. They don't typically feed on other insects or arthropods um, or anything else for that matter. So that's why the primer is only for vertebrates. And then when you amplify it, you're not gonna get any microbes or any bacteria or anything like that because it's just for the vertebrates. So you, we'd expect to see things like people, maybe mice, maybe like farm animals, maybe deer, or elk, um, bears or whatever could be in there. Um, what are the implications of them potentially having significantly different diets? That's also a good question. So. Basically, mosquitoes are a huge disease vector, and what that means is they can go and basically they can bite one thing and transmit a parasite from that thing's blood into something else, or an actual disease could get transmitted. So for me, I was really trying to see the difference between the diets in different species and different locations to see what those implications might be. Not a lot is known about mosquito diet, but if you can identify the organisms they're preying on, you can also identify what like zoonotic vectors there might be that can spread stuff. Um, so that's the, the implications of them having different diets is you could maybe target a few different species to see which ones might be the most dangerous for people. I was going to say most people go far out of their way to avoid finding mosquitoes and, and getting bit. Um, 
did you like do you use different kinds of lore? Like what do you use to try to get mosquitoes to a specific area to, cap to capture them? Yeah, so that's funny. I was the lore. Um, <laughs> okay, got it. I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah so basically sense. they have these sensors that can sense carbon dioxide and it comes out through your skin and also through your breath. And so they'll basically get attracted from that. Um, so I did get very many mosquito bites, but um, the traps that uh, Tara Tiamen used, uh, those are also CO2 traps um, and they're resting traps. So basically they emit a little bit of CO2 after they've gone and they've bit something, they want a place to rest and digest. They see that CO2, they go in and they sit there and you just put a lid on it and close them in. A noble self-sacrifice for science. It's yeah, <laughs> well done. Fantastic, Blake. Thank you. Um, yeah. All right. There's no other questions. Uh, so we are running well ahead of schedule. Congratulations, everybody. Um, but for our final presenters, if you do need to go over the 10 minute mark, that's that's certainly fine. Or we'll have more room for questions. Um, but uh, yeah, doing uh, ending early is also a possibility. So thank you all. Um, our next presenter is Beatrice Lee. She is a microbial biology major. And we are happy to pass the baton to you now. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen really quick. Uh, in the meantime, hi, I'm Beatrice. Uh, I am a second year microbial biology major. And um, basically the past uh, two semesters, I have been uh, joining the Brody Lab on working on a SPUR project where I was exploring computational models and how the microbial traits interact to affect how microbes compete and cooperate under different environmental conditions. So I just wanna kind of give a quick disclaimer that um, this entire project is very computational heavy. So I really wanted to make it as digestible as possible. So um, I did add a lot of words <laughs> rather than pictures, just so those who aren't really familiar with um, like microbial modeling will actually kind of get a sense of uh, what's going on and they can just kind of refer back to the slides. Um, so a little bit about the background of uh, mo microbial models. So the recognition that microbial dynamics and microbial traits play um, in regulating soil uh, biogeochemical reactions has basically been a really huge interest point in um, the field of biology recently, explicitly like the modeling of how the microbes interact with um, their substrate and how it kind of modulates greenhouse gases emissions and carbon soil stocks. So throughout this project, we um, primarily focus on affinity parameters, which are basically essential for substrate kinetic based modeling for um, what we're looking at, which is soil biogeochemistry. <laughs> so uh, affinity basically means um, how well something goes together so or also like the strength of which two or so molecules interact or bind so these types of parameters are primarily uh, determined through wet lab so through batch cultures uh, which actually don't translate that well to conditions in soil so predictive theory of effective substrate affinity parameters account for processes that affect microbial substrate so in this case, uh, we primarily focus on the application to variability saturated soils. Um, so kind of like an overview of uh, the project that I was working on. So we first like focused on an existing theory um, from a literature, from a Tang and Riley literature. And then from there, we kind of analyzed the reference affinity uh, and how it varied with microbial and soil characteristics. And then, um, we actually transitioned into a second part of the project where we analyzed another model called the DEB model, which um, actually has a theory behind it, which I will explain later on and try to determine uh, how it relates to carbon fluxes, as well as we try to implement another model that um, actually would fill in some of the gaps that the DEB theory model uh, did not include. So, a uh, list of objectives for the uh, project was we first wanted to look into the Tang and Riley uh, existing theory and then investigate the variation of microbial substrate uptake rates across two different soil moisture scenarios and uh, identify influential factors um, from the model, or sorry, from the theory and model. So 
the second objective was uh, we're planning on laying the groundwork for incorporating effects of soil moisture on different model processes and microbial physio physiology in uh, the current dynamic energy budget model, which is also known as the DEB model for short. Uh, so just objective slides. So for the first objective, um, so affinity parameters are basically very essential for substrate kinetic based descriptions in soil biochemistry models. But however, they are very often based on measurements defined in uh, well-mixed aqueous solutions. So for variability saturated soils, affinity parameters often have to be calibrated and are very highly like uncertain. So one thing really great about the Tang and Riley uh, um, theory is they developed a theory that actually predicts affinity parameters under variably saturated conditions. And they came up with an analytical like approximation of how substrates are intercepted uh, by microbial cells in a uh, microsite in soils by integrating microbial characteristics such as microsites, uh, uh, structures, as well as soil physical properties. So my microbial substrate uptake uh, it kind of involves the interactions between soil physical structures and soil uh, microbes, which are linked together through diffusive substrate properties. And uh, physical structures is basically kind of represented by um, characters such as like so soil volume element with matrix resistance, which actually depend on bulk soil properties um, that containing microsites with a resistant that depend on water film coverage. So this model is, or this theory is like very complex. So I kind of included a figure of uh, how the theory kind of, or their modeling works. So um, with that in mind, with the Tang and Riley theory, uh, we just decided to generate data by varying these factors, uh, as well as using multivariate linear regression to identify factors that kind of best predict the uptake response to soil moisture in different regimens. Um, so our goal was actually to predict a reference affinity constant in aqueous solutions, as well as an effective affinity constant in soils. So questions that we wanted to keep in mind included like how much did the specific reference affinity vary based on certain microbial traits or the substrate, uh, substrate characteristics or uh, basically their environment such as like soil property. So we looked at the correlation between each variable and what we noticed was actually like the biggest influence on reference affinity constants, which are actually based or Sorry, the biggest effects on reference affinity constant included uh, the transporter density and cell size. As you can kind of tell um, right here, I highlighted it. So it looks like there's actually some sort of correlation between them just based on analyzing uh, the, the two variables together. And for effective affinity constant, it was um, relative saturation. So kind of continuing on the results that we found. So predicted effective solute affinity parameters kind of vary over four to five orders of magnitude as a function of cell volume. And um, de depending on physiological and ecological um, factors at different soil moisture uh, constant, uh, sorry, conditions. So for the second part, um, it was primarily more of a literature review and see how we can actually improve um, the DEB model, which is also known as the dynamic energy budget uh, theory and model. So it's actually a mechanistic rule that describes the uptake and usage of energy and nutrients throughout an individual's life cycle in a single quantitative framework. So actually this model is very widely applied to many, many different types of organisms, not just microbes, um, and is used in a variety of fields such as like conservation, aquaculture, ecotoxicology, um, and general and metabolic ecology. So it's actually still being like widely used uh, now. And it's this model is primarily like motivated by universally observed patterns. Um, so one of the biggest challenges that we noticed with this dynamic energy bu uh, budget model was the model parameterization, which uh, it, there was some uh, parameters that weren't included that we really wanted to include to kind of help improve the model, as well as mappings from large data sets. Um, it was very tough. Um, 
as well as translating genomic information into emergent traits, processes, pathways at the ecosystem level. It, just because um, now, like there's still research being done in this area. So there's still a lot to be uh, discovered, especially when you incorporate these genomic information into how it, uh, it works or yeah, so how it works in a community setting. <laughs> So because of these challenges, we decided to look into another model, which is called the EcoSmarts model, which is a process-based semi-empirical soil microbial model that incorporates physical, chemical, and biological mechanisms that uh, capture drying and rewetting responses. So this model here, here's a uh, kind of an overview of how this model works. It contains eight departments, like including uh, POC, which is particulate organic compounds, which is basically uh, plant material and microbial byproducts available for uh, decomposition, as well as DOC, dissolved organic carbons um, that are usually derived from microbial decay or extra osmolites. Um, active cells, which uh, produce enzymes responsible for uh, POC <laughs> decomposition, uh, dormant cells, active cells, uh, cell residues, as well as um, extracellular uh, enzymes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. And basically why this model is so important is because it can actually figure out the unexpected disconnects between growth respiration rates, um, as well as how that influences uh, carbon uptake efficiency. So I just wanted to kind of show this image of uh, the for formulations of how the EcoSmart worked to uh, determine growth respiration, as well as CUE, which is carbon use efficiency. Um, so uh, one thing we know, uh, one thing when we analyze the literature is uh, each respiration peak kind of throughout a certain period of time. In this case, it's a hundred days. Uh, it looks like the effects of rewetting actually drove CO two emissions. And here in uh, Figure D, here it shows kind of like cumulative rates of respiration and growth on average of uh, carbon use efficiency kind of side by side. So when we looked actually closer, uh, you can kind of see the contribution of different processes to respiration uh, is actually primarily due to the synthesis of biomass as well as osmoregulation. Um, dormancy and mineralization, they were still very important, but it didn't have as great of an impact as uh, the synthesis of biomass as well, or osmoregulation. So it, we kind of expect that this is probably the strongest candidate mechanisms that explain carbon flux response when it comes to drying and rewetting, which kind of shows the decoupled dynamic between the respiration and growth. So uh, kind of future steps, um, I, I'm hoping to continue to work on this project. So we plan on implementing the carbon flux process into the DEB model and derive an analytical approximation of how substrates are intercepted by microbial cells in a microsite in soils by kind of integrating more microbial cells um, in the microsite, or sorry, by integrating more microbial characteristics, microsite structures, soil physical properties and colony expansion rates, as well as compare um, the moisture dependence on the uptake rates from the DEB model to the rate modifying function in um, the EcoSmarts model. So I would also just like to kind of give a quick acknowledgement to my mentor, Gianna, who has been like super helpful, uh, actually letting me help her implement these different soil properties um, as and how she kind of like exposed me to another language that I wasn't familiar with and just being an overall awesome mentor, as well as Ewan Brody, who, uh, kind of headed this project as well, and the Brody Lab and the alumni that actually sponsored this for, uh, project. Thank you. Thanks, Beatrice. Really appreciate your presentation. Um, any questions into the Q&A feature, please? So I, oh, sorry, one second. Um, so I think Gabriella asked, what are the implications of them potentially having significantly different diets? So uh, right now, these models don't exactly look into uh, how their diets affect um, 
the model it primarily looks at more of how these micro microorganisms interact with uh, just more inorganic uh, in inorganic components. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, if any other questions come in, Beatrice, you can answer them in the um, via typing. All right, so next we have Kenneth Trang, also a microbiology student. Uh, take it away, Kenneth. Cool. Hi, everyone. Hope everyone can hear me. Let's try sharing my screen. My mouse has been working. Let me just oh. Let me refresh this. Someone confirm that you can hear me? Yep, yes, we, we can, can hear, hear and see you. Right. Yep. Yep. Cool, okay, yeah. I think it just took a while to load up a little bit. Let's just refresh this. Sorry for the little delay. Uh, thanks to all the presenters here today. It was super cool listening to all your talks. Uh, Beatrice is pretty cool because she talked about models and I'm gonna be talking about some more models. Let's see, hopefully this doesn't end up being too laggy, but um, yeah. So hi everyone, my name is Kenny Trang and I'm a third year majoring in microbial biology. And thanks for joining me for my talk titled Experimental and Model-Based Approaches for Community Assembly Rules Ecology. So while at Berkeley, I've had the honor of working on two independent research projects that are really two sides of the same coin. And what I mean by that is even though they are both concerned with this branch of ecology called assembly rules, each project employs a distinct approach to answering its questions of interest. So today, I hope that by discussing both projects here, I will help capture not only the breadth of research questions available to undergraduates here at Cal, but also demonstrate the wide ranges of approaches our researchers can choose from to answer their questions. So first, what is a community assembly rule? So community assembly rules are a way to conceptualize the different obstacles that every species must overcome in order to survive. You can imagine out of all the species that live on planet Earth, only some species are able to overcome the unique challenges of any particular environment. And that these species are the ones you find at any given time and place. So let's first use an easy example of a polar bear to see assembly rules in action. As you might imagine, polar bears don't live in places where it's too hot. Temperature is one common obstacle that limits where species can live. And it's one of the many abiotic factors, which are the non-living factors in the environment like rainfall and acidity. However, even if polar bears could overcome the heat, we must also consider the living component of their environment or the biotic factors, such as the presence of their favorite fish to eat or how much competition for food there is. Lastly, it won't matter how perfect the habitat might be if that location is inaccessible to polar bears. Therefore, we also have to consider dispersal factors like mountains or oceans that might separate them from this new location. Altogether, if you understand exactly which assembly rules are in play in any given habitat and know all the different ways every species is affected by each assembly rule, you can predict where every species is on the planet. Of course, in practice, this is a tremendous undertaking that is further complicated by the fact that these factors can change rapidly due to climate change. However, attempting to understand this complexity is what science is all about. So how do we go about our research? Let's again practice with a simple question first. How does, temp how does temperature limit where polar bears can live? To answer this, we could either create a model on our computers or get our hands dirty and do an experiment. The modeling approach will, take, will involve taking data about where polar bears are found, like this one, and combining it with data about temperature, like this one. We can then use statistics to determine the temperatures associated with where polar bears live and the temperatures associated where they don't live to make a statistical answer of how temperature limits polar bear distribution. But of course, how do we really know that polar bears don't live at warm temperatures because they can't tolerate higher heats? Maybe there's another underlying factor besides temperature that is actually limiting their distribution that makes it seem like temperature is actually the limiting factor. How do we isolate temperature? The simple answer is we do an experiment. For example, we can put a polar bear in a cold room, crank up the temperature and record how it affects them. Obviously, however, compared to modeling, this approach is not only harder and more expensive, but it's a lot less ethical. Therefore, sometimes even though the answers modeling can provide can be limiting, other times it might be the best option. As researchers, we have to understand the pros and cons of each approach 
and make the best decision for our goals and resources. So finally, let's dive into my own project to see what assembly rules ecology looks like for real. So while you might be familiar with mistletoes from the holiday season tradition, mistletoes are actually global plant parasites who use their host trees as sources of water and nutrients. From the assembly rules perspective, plant parasites are particularly interesting to study because plant parasitism is thought to have evolved as a survival strategy in dry places like deserts, where the inconsistency of rainfall drove some plants to instead start relying on the more consistent water supply of other plants. In other words, plant parasites were able to escape the abiotic constraint of water availability by taking on a less limiting biotic constraint, their host plant. This hypothesis has been validated by past modeling data. If you look on the right, you can see that even though habitat types range from deserts to rainforests throughout Australia, that the distribution of mistletoes shown on the left is pretty consistent throughout all of Australia. This suggests that mistletoes are not affected by the changing environment. However, I personally wondered to what extent this was really true. Can all mistletoes really live in the desert? If there are some that can't, what are the characteristics shared between the ones that can and can't? I was particularly interested in the ways different parasites attach to their host, called the Hostoro Union. Thankfully, the research collection at Berkeley houses the largest Hostoro collection in the world, and I used this collection to group mistletoe species into different Hostoro groups and created individual models for each. I hypothesized that hy sorry, I hypothesized that Hostoro types that are the least efficient at obtaining water from their host would be most affected by the abiotic environment and therefore could not live in the desert, while the types were the, that were the most efficient at obtaining water would be able to escape the abiotic constraint of rainfall and live in the desert. So here's my general workflow. Instead of looking at one variable at a time like we did before with the polar bears, I used 39 different variables simultaneously. I also took it a step further than just using descriptive data and, creative, and created predictive models. Since I'm a biologist and not a statistician, I wanna skip over all the crazy math and just get right to the results. But if you want to know more, you can always just email me. So the results overall supported my hypothesis that the structure of the host parasite union related to the extent that the sorry that the structure of the host parasite union relates to the extent that the abiotic environment constrains distribution. Here are the different predictive models for each hosterotype. Red colors here indicate for that model that there is a high suitability in that area, while blue colors represent low suitability. The best way to understand these models quickly is to understand that if the abiotic environment didn't limit where these parasites could live, everywhere would be one single color, therefore meaning that it would be equally suitable in all locations, no matter the different kinds of environments in Australia. You can see for the models on the left that the colors change pretty dramatically across the entire continent. These are the parasites with the least efficient attachment style. While for the one in the corner, which had the most efficient attachment style, the model was pretty green throughout the entire continent, suggesting that uh, it doesn't care what the environment, the abiotic environment looks like. So this overall suggests that as parasites get better at taking water from their host, they're getting less and less affected by the environment and less and less dependent on the environment and more dependent on their host. So yeah, that was about two years of work summarized in about two minutes, which might not be as satisfying as it might have been as if we had more time, but I want to quickly dive into my experiments for the summer before we run out of time. So one other area where assembly rules is of particular interest right now is in the gut microbiome. You might have heard in the last decade, scientists and doctors have discovered that uh, what bacteria you have living in your gut is important from everything from obesity and diabetes to drug eff efficacy and autism. Therefore, there is currently a great interest in understanding the factors that determine whether we have good or bad bacteria which of course we can use assembly rules to figure out. For my project, I'm particularly interested in how genetics affects what bacteria are present. To answer this question, I am doing experiments with the warm C. elegans. Doing experiments with worms instead of humans is particularly advantageous, not only because we share 80% of our genes with it, but it's also much cheaper and a lot more ethical to do experiments with. So here's the general workflow of my experiment. I'm gonna expose worms to a lot of different bacteria and see which ones are able to colonize the worm's gut and then repeat this for worms where I deleted some genes. Oh, sorry. I want you to all imagine that the worm gut is just like any other environment and that by changing the environment's characteristics one by one, meaning removing a gene one by one, we will change the assembly rules present 
and that will allow us to isolate the effect that each gene has on the bacteria present inside. So let's first say that I find three bacteria, these three bacteria, that can colonize a normal worm's gut. But now I knock out a gene in the mouth of the worm and find now that only these two bacteria can colonize. That would suggest that the gene I knock out is important for letting that third bacteria colonize. Now let's say I knock out a different gene, maybe an immunity gene, and find out that the composition completely changes. That would suggest that this gene is really important for microbiome structure. By doing this for many genes, we can slowly piece together the deeper genetic mechanisms at play, which hopefully will one day help doctors manipulate the microbiome of humans to make sure that we only get the ones that make us healthy. So that's all I have for you today. I wish I had more time to geek out about this stuff, but time is really limited. Uh, but in summary, I hope you can now appreciate that research can be done in many different ways and that assembly rules is a really cool way to understand the world and can be incredibly important for conservation and medicine. Lastly, I want to give a big shout out to the Rose Hill Foundation uh, for my summer funding last summer and the one to come this summer, the NSF and the NIH for our research grants. And lastly, my advisors, Carol Wilson, Clyde Calvin, and Michael Shapiro. Uh, and of course, thanks to uh, SPUR and CNR for allowing me to speak today and kind of creating the best college experience ever. And uh, I haven't used SPUR funding yet, but I plan on using it next year. So uh, thank you in advance. Uh, thanks, everyone. And I guess I can answer any questions if you all have any. Uh, which it looks like there are, right? Let's see. Uh, oh, comments on the polar bears? Cool, yeah. Uh, I try to make it as fun as possible, and I think polar bears are a good example. But um, if anyone has any other questions, uh, you can put them in the chat uh, in the next couple minutes, and I'll answer them in the chat. Uh, but thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kenny. I have a much greater appreciation of um, mistletoe. Next time I have a cross that, I will have a better understanding. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, if anybody has any questions in the Q&A, please, and Kenny can answer them for you. Um, our final presenter of the morning, Emily Z, uh, from also a microbiology student. Emily, take it away. Thank you. Oh, can everyone see that? Yep. Okay, awesome. Uh, hi, my name is Emily C, and I'm a second year microbial biology major. And today I will be presenting my research project titled Dispersal Mediated Seed Plant Interactions in the Alpine Plant Community. First, I'll give a brief description of the field site and the ecosystem of interest. The alpine ecosystem can be characterized by high winds, low temperatures, and short growing seasons. Uh, the data was collected from the field site at Mount Baldy, which is in Colorado. Um, <laughs> and the elevation is 3,540 meters above sea level. Plants within this ecosystem type face multiple abiotic and biotic challenges that can influence them at different parts of their life histories. Seed dispersal is the movement of seeds and it's important because it allows seeds the opportunity to reach different growing sites. Seed dispersal outcomes can be altered by vegetative plants in the community. These plants in the community can impede seed movement by physically trapping seeds and in doing so influence those seeds fitness. Species interactions play a direct role in determining species presence, abundance, and reproductive success. And this research is important because alpine ecosystems are among the most jeopardized by climate change and the hypothesized positive interactions that play a role in community structure may be influenced as a result. Um, so my research question for this project was, how does the seed trapping ability of vegetative plants differ by morphology? Um, and I included on the side what I meant by seed trapping. You can see some examples of that um, in the images. I hypothesized that plants will differ in ability to trap seeds by morphology, and I predicted that densely vegetative growth forms uh, catch the most seeds. The objective of this project um, is to identify patterns in seed vegetative plant interactions, as well as investigate how vegetative plants affect seed dispersal outcomes. So I'm going to talk about my uh, project design. So two traps were placed at each focal plant and at the um, at the field site. One was placed as close to the center of the at the plant, so pretty much at the plant, and one was placed around 10 centimeters outside the plant. The next step, which was my role in the project, was to separate the contents from the traps. Um, so that involved removing scree, which were the rocks. Uh, and separate those from the seeds. And then the last step was to identify and categorize them. Uh, overall, there were 110 uh, focal plants and these traps were uh, set out for around a month at the field site. 
so now I'm going to um, show you the types of uh, plants that I was working with. Uh, they differ in morphology. As you can see, some are very densely vegetated and others not so much. There are some that are mat like and others that are more grassy. Each specific species of plant is listed below uh, in the pic below the picture. So I'm going to give everyone a couple seconds to kind of take it all in and to familiarize themselves with the types of uh, plant species um, that I'll be referring to in some of my other slides. Um, next are the seed types. So um, as you can see, they look pretty different across the five species. On the top row, um, they have a structure called a pappus, or for multiple, a papi. And the bottom row, you can see that they vary in shape, size, um, length, and width. Um, and so I'm also going to give people a little bit of time to just kind of look at these um, seed types as well. Uh, so you have a better picture of what I'm going to be elaborating on in my next slide. Um, so now I'm going to show you all some results, the exciting part. Uh, this is a heat map of the average seed count differences. The main takeaway here um, is that more seeds were caught on average uh, in traps in the vegetation versus um, non-vegetated areas. Um, and this was important because the seed count differences were calculated by subtracting the non-vegetative seed count from the seed count in vegetation. Therefore, the values that were calculated by taking the difference between vegetative and non-vegetative traps were due to the morphology of the plant. So that was really crucial. Uh, another takeaway is that plants across all growth forms caught more heterotheca seeds on average. And if you recall, that was the small carrot looking seed uh, with the pappus in the previous slide. Uh, my next slide is the dot plot of seed counts in relation to plant type. Um, in each panel, it shows the different uh, plant species. And overall, there were not strong differences in seed trapping across growth forms, which was surprising. Also, trapping maximums tended to be greater in vegetation. So you can see that based on the fact that there are a lot of seeds, especially at the greatest frequency of seeds caught, um, found um, on the positive side of the um, dot plot. Um, so overall, what were the patterns that we saw? Uh, there were, uh, and we saw that um, there were weak effects of plant growth form on seed trapping, and that there were also strong effects of seed traits on trapping. Uh, this feeds really nicely into the project that I have planned for my honors project, which is to relate seed functional traits to the patterns and to also determine which of the traits have the most impact. So I'd be examining um, pappus length, uh, seed length, and width, and thickness. Um, also, it's uh, another thing that I hope to do is to compare these trapping patterns to the observed plant spatial distributions in the ecosystem. Um, and this is really important research because seed trapping may have a non-stochastic or random effect on a community structure. And forecasting change in trapping patterns under climate change will be really crucial in the coming years. Um, and then I'd like to take this time to acknowledge and um, thank my lab mentor, Courtney Ray, and my faculty member, or my faculty advisor, Benjamin Blonder. Um, they have been really crucial in my development as a researcher, um, and they've given me so much guidance and support throughout this whole process. So big thank you. Um, I would also like to thank the SPUR program for providing me the opportunity to uh, explore my interests outside of the classroom setting. Uh, and I'll open the floor up to some questions if y'all have any. Um, you can also email me at emily.x at berkeley.edu. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks, Emily. That was a great presentation. We do have a question. How long did it take to remove the seeds from the traps and identify different seed types? Oh, um, that process took um, actually really long. So um, there were 110 uh, focal plants. And in this project, I identified five different species. Um, so I would say estimate on the conservative end that each uh, cup took me around maybe like five minutes to identify a uh, one seed type. So that's like five times 110 cups opening and closing them, and then moving uh, seeds to their appropriate um, uh, like storage container. So that's around 550 times that I had to open and close those cups at like 
um, five minutes a cup. So that's, <laughs> that's kind of challenging, but um, it was worth it. So yeah, you can see all my cool figures. So, yep. Um, okay, thanks, Emily. I think that is uh, all we have for questions right now. If anybody else has any more questions for Emily, please feel free to add them in the Q&A and she can add, uh, type the response up for you. So that concludes the Spring 21 Virtual Research Showcase. Thank you to all of our presenters for sharing their amazing research experiences with us and thank you all for attending. On a personal note, speaking of the advisors in the college, we are so very proud of you. Well done, all of you. Um, I'm very particularly proud because a lot of the microbiology students presented today, so thank you. And MEB students as well. Uh, this, and environmental students, obviously everybody. <laughs> This presentation will be available on our Rouser College of Natural Resources YouTube channel and our Cal Week website. And I think uh, Craig's gonna share a little bit of information with us now. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, thanks again, everybody. It's been um, phenomenal. I know I've been working with you all for weeks and maybe months at this point in terms of communication. And um, yeah, we're, we, we did it. That's yeah, congratulations. Um, we do have a second part of this research showcase. So this morning was uh, focusing roughly in bio biological sciences. Um, this afternoon will be social science topics. So from uh, 1 to 3 p.m. today, we'll have our next fleet of presenters. Um, and so uh, join us for that if you're interested, and we'd appreciate that. Um, if you'd like to hear more uh, about these research presentations or present your research in the future, um, be on the lookout. We will have another fall research showcase happening. Um, later this year and so that will be on uh, information will be that on this poster sessions website and that is also where to find the link for this afternoon session um, for our research showcase um, additionally what else do i need to talk about uh, our virtual bulletin board so for all browser college students um, i'm also the person who manages the virtual bulletin board and the monday um, emails that go out every week um, we'll continue to plug internship opportunities campus happening student org events um, research opportunities, uh, everything like that will still be updated throughout the summer. Um, and so keep an eye on that if you uh, want to stay in touch. And um, yeah, thank you all. Wonderful semester and wonderful presentations. Thank you, guys. <laughs>